good people. How's everybody doing today? Let me make sure my sound's good. I think we are okay. Good to see you. Happy Monday. Hope you all enjoyed your weekend. Uh, sorry, I'm just doing a little uh, computer uh, updates and upgrades to make sure that we're ready for today. Pseudo apt upgrade, uh, but I'm happy because it's a nice day here in Maryland. I hope it's a nice day where you're at. What's up, Asia? Good to see you. I know the intro song. You know, one day we'll have to put a little gif of people doing their little dance up there. What's up, Gant to see us go? Good to see you. What's up, Kristen? Uh, Kristen? Kristen to go? Welcome. What's up, N. Smith? Good to see you. Mosin. Hello, hello. Welcome. What's up, JM? LD, VLP. Exclamation point slides. I did not upgrade the slides. Let me do that right now. Exclamation point commands. Uh, edit slides. Let me give you the new slides for today. If you are in the Google Classroom, you should have seen the new stuff drop. Um, it should have dropped right at 7 p.m. <laughs> no, we are not going into Docker today, unfortunately. Uh, we're just getting a basic dev environment set up. Uh, you know, we got a couple more weeks for Docker in the DevOps course. But keep keep asking, keep asking. We'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Oh no, I dropped some coffee on my Wacom tablet. All right, let me hop into the classroom and make sure everything's good there. Nope. <laughs> Are you learning it now? Dope. Nope, let me know if you have any questions. Um, it's a great technology. It's one of my favorites, to be honest. One of my favorite things to teach as well. Linux is my favorite thing to teach. Uh, and then probably Docker right after that. So camp code. And yeah, it looks like everything dropped. So this week, I don't know why this didn't drop. It's still supposed to drop at 7 p.m., <laughs> but it will. No big deal. So this week is the first week where you actually have some stuff to do outside of class. So you're going to have some extra work to do. Now, we haven't learned how to really code or anything yet, so you don't have any uh, real homework. You more so have material to go over. There is a quiz, so this is going to be your first quiz this week as well. Uh, take it. Again, it's more for you. It will be graded. Um, but, yeah, it's more for you to kind of understand some of those things. So there's most of the stuff that's in there are things that you know that you've learned already. Some of the stuff is either on the edge of what we know or right outside of what we know. And again, this is just going to be designed to get you to start Googling to start looking around. It's a quiz. Go ahead and Google. It's completely okay uh, to Google. Uh, the goal is to, to learn the information. Uh, then there's there's a couple different things here. Uh, some of them have more than one item inside of them. So take a look. This is for your extended learning. Uh, you don't have to do each of these things, but I highly encourage you to take a look, uh, at least at the topic. You you know try to look at what I'm trying to portray to you, what I'm trying to deliver to you. And if you want to go look, you know go down the rabbit hole, look at some other things. Feel free to do so as well. Is coding class important for an intending DevOps engineer? So. Yes, um, I think it's helpful. It's not 100% necessary, uh, but it it is it's a significant tool that will, uh, it, without having some programming concepts, uh, it will be difficult for you to do a lot of the things that exist, uh, that you would have to do as a DevOps engineer. So absolutely, um, absolutely. This, this will definitely be helpful for you, Sammy. Uh, where are we looking? So this is just inside the Google Classroom. If you're not in the Google Classroom, you can hit exclamation point uh, exclamation point code classroom. If you want to get in there, you don't have to get in there. I'm going in here just so I can get the slides for today. Week two slides scheduled for 7 PM still haven't dropped for some reason. Uh, let me, let me get you the link for these. So let me update the, the chat command for this really quick. Copy link. Let's get over here. Command edit slides. All right. If you hit exclamation point, did that, did I do that wrong? Commands. That's what commands, right? That looks right but it popped up. Okay, cool. It took a little while for that to take effect. Uh, now, if you hit exclamation point slides, it should provide you with the proper slides. And here is the slide link right here. You can't scale and amplify your level of effort without knowing to code a script. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you, you've you got to understand some programming concepts. You don't need all of the things that are in this course, uh, but definitely I, I highly recommend it to everyone. Like honestly, in most sectors of tech, um, I think I think learning how to code, at least have a having a working knowledge of code, is uh, really 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 helpful. Looks like all four emails have hit my inbox. FY, perfect. 
All right. So yeah, tonight we're just going to be going over some environment setup. And again, remember for some of you, you've, you've been diving into some of this stuff and you're familiar with some of this stuff. So again, it might feel like we're going a little bit slow right now, but we'll really get going. Uh, probably, you know, within the next two weeks, we'll, we'll really get going. For people who have never done this before, this is gonna be perfect for you tonight. We're gonna to get your computer set up. This is always where the most questions happen. This is always where people get super confused right up front uh, just because a lot of you have different levels of working knowledge with your computer. Some people, you know, some people are pros at their computer but don't know how to code yet. Some people, you know, use it just for emails and, you know, they learned what they need to learn for work, but that's about it. They can use Microsoft Word, all that. Um, so this is this sometimes can be a little bit uh, heavy for people. So we're going to go through and do our best to make sure you're set up. So don't be afraid to ask questions today. Don't be afraid to take screenshots and post them in a discord to get help. If you're having trouble, um, we're going to, we're going to do our best to make sure everyone gets up to speed today. We're also going to take uh, a break every, uh, like five minutes to the hour, uh, every hour. So people can go to the bathroom and stuff. Um, we said we were going to do it. I forgot to do it. And then we, uh, someone brought it up in the discourse, so thank you. So let me just set a little alarm right now to make sure we don't forget. Let's go 7.55 p.m. All right, there we go. I don't know how to put this on my PC. Uh, yes, so when you say, I don't know how to put this on my PC, um, let me know whenever you all do need help. Tell me exactly what you need. So that this is going to be, this is one of the biggest things in tech. Uh, we're going to start practicing saying exactly what it is that we need. Uh, so whenever you are having trouble, try to be as descriptive as possible so we can get you as much help as we can. So I don't know why the words aren't here. Uh, so I'll just remove them. I don't remember what those words were supposed to be, uh, but let's go. <laughs> All right, so environment setup. We're gonna learn a lot about a lot a lot of things today. So one, development environments. I you, you're gonna hear this term a lot. You're gonna go a lot of places and hear this. Uh, what does this mean? So, a development environment in software uh, and web development is a workspace uh, for developers to make changes without breaking anything in a live environment. So live environment. This, this definition doesn't make any sense unless you know what a live environment is. And a live environment is a place where people are accessing and, and utilizing the software that you've built, whether it's a website, whether it's a certain program, um, that code is going to be running somewhere. It's gonna be uh, usually on some type of web server because we do a lot of web stuff nowadays. So usually it's gonna be sitting on a web server and it's going to be, uh, uh, people are gonna be accessing it over the internet and it's gonna be doing some work uh, for them. and. The place that they're going to access this code is the live environment. So when you're trying to build new things, you don't want to introduce any changes to something that's already working. It makes it easy to break things. It's, it's, it's pretty dangerous to do so. So development environments allow you to section off a workspace for you to be able to develop new code, new features, new things without affecting any environment uh, that is live and working. Okay. <clears throat> There are a bunch of stages of development environments. Uh, this is all up to you. There's no, there's no specific rule of thumb here. There's no, uh, there's no tried and true method. There's, there's things that people do consistently, um, but you can have as many environments as you would like. You can have as many different workspaces as you would like. And this is kind of the standard workflow for environments. Local. This is, this is something I do want you to remember. Uh, which button is it? Is it this one? Here we go. Local, whoops, that didn't do. Oh, actually I have to start up the program. Give me one second. It's called G Inc. There we go. So this is where we're gonna be setting up today. It's gonna be your local environment, okay? So local is what we're setting up today. You don't need the rest. Okay, but what local means, whenever someone says your local environment, your local machine, this is always your computer. Okay, sometimes you might be doing something, maybe, maybe your job gave you a development server or something, maybe. But local is your machine, your computer. Uh, and then once you do some work, a lot of companies, a lot of team development teams set up uh, a development environment. So this development environment says, hey, 
I've developed code locally on my computer. I have all the things I need running locally on my computer. And I, I started to build this thing and I think it's good to go. And oftentimes you want to see this in a space that's not on your computer. You want to see this in a space that's closer to how it's going to look when you are uh, finally running the application where it's supposed to live. And so sometimes these things go to a development environment and a development environment is going to be a little bit, uh, sometimes a little bit chaotic. <laughs> It's, that's the word I like to use with this. Uh, a little bit volatile. Volatile or is it volatile? I'm not sure. Um, it's gonna be a little bit volatile. So uh, it may it may have problems. It may break uh, because this is where people are pushing, ex generally pushing experimental code. You know, they think it works, uh, but they haven't tested it with a lot of other things. And that's the kind of goal here to, to see it working with other things to start doing some testing around it. Uh, and it, it's, it's generally uh, more okay for things to break here. This is where you want it to break. Things break here. Uh, break here. Okay, so usually again, this is oftentimes people call this dev or development, uh, and usually that's the case. Usually it's the first stage of things. Uh, then people send things to a staging environment. So uh, you'll work out all of your issues here in the development environment. And as things get a little more tight knit, we push it to a staging environment. The staging environment usually looks like your production environment looks like live uh, or production. All right, so you might hear live sometimes. Uh, I actually never hear anyone call it live. People call this prod or production. This is where the things are actually running at. This is where the code exists when you want people to actually access it. And so staging is a good place for this to happen. You want staging generally to be a little bit uh, pretty stable. Okay, your, your goal is to make it as stable as possible uh, to keep it looking like production. And again, it's staging the code before it goes to production. So staging before production. And so we'll talk about, we'll talk a lot more about code promotion and things like that. This is, this is down the line. This is completely down the line, but I want you to understand the concept of development environments and that there are different environments in which we use to build and run our code. And today we are going to be setting up again, that local environment. This is going to give you the ability to, uh, to run and test, uh, go code right on your local machine. So your own computer, that's what we're going to be doing today. And let's go ahead and screenshot this so we can include it in our notes later. Cool. Clear it. All right. So we're going to build our local environment today. Now you're going to, you're going to see a couple new concepts and we're not going to go deep into some of these things because we have whole days dedicated to this. Literally next class is all about the command line interface and learning how to interact with the computer from the command line interface. But this is how, um, this is how we're going to run code. Generally, uh, we don't have to, this is how we're going to learn to run code today. You're going to learn how to, you're going to learn a little bit, uh, on how to interact with the command line interface. Today, you'll learn just a few commands, uh, mostly centered around Golang or, or getting Go to run. Uh, in the next class, you'll learn all of the tools that you need for uh, navigating the computer via the command line. But what is the command line? Uh, the command line interface processes commands to a computer program in the form of, in the form of lines of text. So we can interact with our computer in two different ways. We can look at things visually and click on buttons and drag things around. And this is called a graphical user interface. We're gonna talk about that, but you can also interact with your computer via commands, via text, uh, and you can issue commands to it, which it will process and do what you want. This is how we are going to interact with the computer to do the coding that we're going to be doing. We're going to be inputting, uh, our code into a graphical user interface. But when we go to run it, when we go to do some things around it, uh, we'll be also dealing with the command line. And so it's, uh, it's important to do, uh, yes, we're going to be learning go. That's what, that's the language we're working with. Golang is go the standard in DevOps space. Uh, I would say, I would say go in Python. Um, yeah, I would definitely say go in Python in the DevOps space, Go is, is like used for a lot of tooling. Uh, a lot of DevOps tools are made out of this. People make command line tools, all kinds of stuff out of Go. Uh, but yeah, that and Python for sure are, are pretty prevalent. Can't go wrong with either one.
All right. So, how do we use the command line interface? Well, there's a couple of different ways to access the uh, the interface to issue some commands. And so, whether uh, depending on the platform that you have, it's going to determine how you're going to access. Uh, the command line. So Windows, you have a couple of options. Windows actually has the most options uh, for doing this. It's com you can choose whichever one you'd like. Um, and I kind of listed them in ease order, I guess. But if you're on a Windows machine, if you're comfortable with Windows, that's what you know. Uh, command prompt is what you are going to be using. So you hit the Windows key. If you hit the Windows key or go into your start menu and you type in command prompt, you will get this application called Command Prompt, and you can simply click on it, and now you can issue commands to your Windows computer. Again, this is Windows specific, Command Prompt is for Windows, okay? So you're completely free to use that. Uh, you can also use PowerShell in Windows. Uh, pretty sure PowerShell ships with all Windows things. It looks very similar to Command Prompt when you first open it up, uh, but it actually has some extra tools in it. Also, if you didn't know, uh, I learned this last year, only last year, but PowerShell is not a Windows specific tool. It's actually an open source tool that you can install on Linux or even Mac, I believe, which is pretty darn crazy. I know you can install it on Linux, uh, but I had no idea, no idea at all. Uh, but PowerShell, you can use that as well. And the last one is WSL. So the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated to install. Uh, so I don't expect you to do it today. If you have no idea what it is, don't try to install it during this class. Use either uh, use either the command prompt or PowerShell for today if Windows is your machine of choice and you have no idea what I'm talking about when we're talking about uh, WSL. But Windows actually has something called the, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and so what this is, is it, it actually installs a custom Linux kernel right inside of your Windows and it has some great integration with Windows and it's really cool. Like it's, you have native window, uh, native Linux right inside of Windows and you can do all the things that you need to do. It really is a game changer. Uh, for for development, it, it is the reason why I use Windows. Uh, because of it, I can use Windows for all of the things that I do now. You know, feel how you want about it. But yeah, that is what. Uh, yeah, WSL is dope. So check it out if you want some links on it. Um, I'll give you some some links to install it. It's pretty easy to install. Uh, but you know, only really need to if you already know what Linux is. If not, for for right now, you can use Command Prompt or PowerShell. For Mac folks, uh, you already have, because you have a Unix com uh, a, a Unix based computer, a Unix like uh, computer, uh, you can just use your terminal application. It's, uh, it's, it's completely okay. 19 to 25 are empty. I don't even think we have that many slides today, uh, but thanks for the heads up. Uh, but yes, you can, oh yes, these are, these are correct. These aren't, they're not empty. <laughs> I know it looks, they look empty. This is exactly what they're supposed to look like. But yeah, Mac folks, simply open up your terminal. Simply open up, so hit, hit uh, what's it? Command space bar to open up your finder, search thing, spotlight, type in terminal. The application ships with your computer. That is how you will access your command prompt. It will look much like um, the command prompt did when I opened it. It'll look something like this, maybe a little bit more gray, but it'll be a little thing here with a blinking cursor and you can start to type and submit information if you want. So terminal is all you have to use if you're on a Mac computer. <laughs> this is why developers like Mac uh, because you know they don't have to do anything special to, to get that access. And then uh, you can use uh, the same thing if you are on Linux. So you can also use terminal if you are on Linux. Uh, yeah, so Chrome does have some Linux integrations. Uh, there are some really cool things you can do with a Chromebook. If you're a Chrome user, you have a couple. You have a couple of options, and those are coming up right now. One is GitHub Code Spaces. So, uh, use Arch. By the way, excellent. I'm glad to use Arch. Uh, I too use Arch. By the way, sometimes, every now and then, and you must know. I also use Vim. I'm also a Vim user. Just so you know. Just so you know. Uh, geek. A geeky IAC, yes, it's infrastructure as code. It's being able to take servers and systems and networks and to be able to define them with code and deploy them out uh, into a cloud service. It's not, it doesn't have to be a cloud service, but uh, that's usually what we're talking about. We're talking about infrastructure as code. Uh, you know, one of the bigger use cases. 
Um, but yes, defining that infrastructure with actual code, with text, saying, hey, I would like a network that looks like this. I would like a server that looks like this, uh, with these kind of specs, with this, with all these different things, and submitting them to an API and them giving it to you. Um, so yes, GitHub Code Spaces is one thing that you could use. GitHub Code Spaces does cost money though, but it is the best, I'm telling you this first because it's the best option. All right, this class in particular isn't a command line class. So if you do want to learn command line stuff, I would, I would, uh, in your Chrome user, I would, I would check out if you hit exclamation point VODs, I would check out what we did on the, um, on the, the last DevOps class. We're learning Linux right now in the DevOps anthology course on Thursdays. And you can use, uh, you can actually get free credits from L Linode for a VPS, uh, and that'll give you a full Linux environment uh, for you. But for this class, uh, I don't think you necessarily need that. Um, but actually, if you want though, if you do exclamation point Linode, this guide, if, you, if you're worried about things, you don't want to mess around with your own computer, uh, th that guide that I just put in there with exclamation point Linode, this will teach you how to, like after you watch today's class and understand what, what your environment is and the pieces that are going to be in there, uh, this will show you how to hook up your VS code to a remote Linode instance uh, so that it's kind of seamless. Um, and so you could do that if you want um, for a... Yeah, for a Chrome user, you, you, they, they do have some SSH tools uh, for you to be able to log into a remote system. So if you watch that first Linux course, uh, it'll show you how to get logged into a Linode uh, computer. But you have some other options, so don't 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 fret just yet if you are a Chrome user. So GitHub Code Spaces is one which I like a lot, but costs you a little bit of money. Uh, also, there is REPL.IT. I think I did a slide on that. Maybe. Okay, I did not do one, but if you want to just uh, run code and not actually have to worry about some of the stuff that we're going to have to worry about. Uh, if you head over to, uh, REPL that I, Oh, actually they, did they change this? Is it different now? Nice. Okay. Maybe it's always been this and I didn't notice. Um, it used to literally be REPL dot IT. Um, but now it's REPL Um, and they, it looks like they make you log in now. They also didn't make you log in before. Uh, but this is a free platform. Again, at least it was free. Let me see. Yeah, there's a free tier, which will give you a space to do exactly what we're gonna be doing today. Now, this is great because it'll give you all the things that you need, especially again, as a Chrome user, um, this so that you don't have to worry about all dealing with all the mess that we're doing, but it is valuable to learn how to do these things locally. You will, if you wanna work in this, if you wanna work in the industry, uh, understanding how to set up your local environment is gonna be helpful. Oh, REPL.io the entire time. Maybe it is. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's. I'm pretty sure it's. It, I, I'm pretty sure it's REPL.it. Uh, and it read, it does redirect. Uh, but it looks like they're getting a little bit more fancy. Um, fancy now. Now there's another place that we're gonna learn about. Uh, that's also gonna make it easier for you to keep up for a little for a little while. Um, actually, for most of the class, you can use this. The, the issue uh, is gonna be more around saving files and things like that. Um, but there is a, a place called, uh, there's something called the Go Playground. So play.golang.org, okay? So if you go, if you go to play.golang.org, This is going to give you a space where you can start to do some Go development and you can run your code and see it work. And so you, you're you not gonna get access to a command line, but it's gonna be a way for you to participate fully uh, as we write Go code. Um, but you are gonna be missing a few things. Something we're working on, something we're working on right now is there's a tool called Coder. Uh, which, allow, which is gonna allow us to run uh, we're gonna self-host. We're gonna we're gonna host uh, developer workspaces. And so anyone who is having trouble or anyone who needs a workspace for development, uh, we're gonna be we're, you're gonna be able to spin one up dynamically, uh, and you're gonna be able to access this online. Um, we're working on it right now. We're trying to figure out how it works without us going broke because uh, it's gonna have to run on a system that we pay for uh, or systems that we pay for. Uh, but we are working on uh, we're actually working on this right now. So hopefully either later in the course or by the next time we run a boot camp, uh, this will be available for anybody to make things much, uh, much easier. 
uh, to, to get access to something without having to put forward any money. I interviewed uh, Ripple IT. It was so awkward. Yep. I, you know, it. W wait, did you interview? Are you saying you interviewed at the company or you interviewed using Repl? What's up there, the Amazing Raven? Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So let's keep moving to make sure we actually, I think we're gonna have plenty of time today, but let's keep moving just in case we don't. So I went a little bit forward. Let's get going. So now we're at the, at the place where we're actually going to get go installed. And this is where, if you're going to run into any issues today, it's going to be during this process. It's going to be during the, uh, the running of go getting go installed and set up to run. Okay. Uh, so don't be afraid. You know, if, if you, if, don't feel bad if you start to run into issues, it happens. We'll really try to help you work through them. Let us know your issues as soon as you run into them. Uh, but we're going to get go installed. Programming languages are just like, uh, generally just like any other application you've installed on your computer. Uh, so if you, if you're used to installing a program on any computer that you have been using on Mac or on windows or on Linux, uh, this is not going to be any different. Okay, so it's, it's a program that's gonna run that we have to execute when we're ready to execute it. So let's get going. I interviewed at the company, it was awkward. Uh, interesting, I, I, one day, I, I love to hear, I love to hear about that. Like awkward interviews are always the, they, they, they're, they're worse than bad interviews to me. I think awkward, I think when the interview is awkward, uh, it makes it difficult because sometimes it has nothing to do with like, what you know, like, like you get thrown off completely. You'll, you'll know everything they're asking, but like, can't really answer properly because everything's all weird. And like, I don't know, a bad interview is just a bad interview, but an awkward interview is an uncomfortable interview to me. I'm fine with a bad interview that just says, Hey, I'm not cut out for this role. <laughs> uh, but the, but the awkwardness is weird. I'm talking through my code and whatnot, and I would get nothing back. It's like nothing back. Oh, that's the worst. So I was confused. Ah, no feedback is absolutely the worst. It, like talking to a brick wall, like it is, it makes it very, very difficult. Uh, that sounds like it sucks a lot. That's me with my favorite IDE and I said Vim, short, awkward silence. Okay, okay, I haven't got a lot of those. So uh, yeah, that that would that would bother me. Cause then you're trying to think of like, oh, do I, do I fill the silence or something? Like what's going on? Like, did they hate that answer? Like, yeah, that's, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I'm gonna interview my manager today. My interviewer today made me wait until now. Wow. That's who, you know, it, it is rough out here. Definitely rough out here. Okay. Let's get, let's start getting go installed. And then we'll definitely have time to talk about some, uh, some interview stuff. Uh, cause I think the more, I think the more we, we the earlier we can get out in front of some of this stuff, uh, the better. So install and go exclamation point go. So this link right here should, should, I'm not hundred percent sure, but it should go dev slash doc slash install. What it should do is it should open up a, the, the go website, the go documentation website. Uh, and it should take you to an install page <clears throat> that's specific to your computer. Okay. So let's, let, let me, let me try to go to it. Or to your operating system, actually. Go dot doc dot. Uh, I already forgot what it was. Oh, go dot dev. They changed the name of their website. It used to be like godoc.org. Um, and so now it's go dot dev slash doc slash install. Go equals installing go is harder than coding with go. You're not wrong. You're not 100% wrong. So it should take you to a page and the the way that you know if it's gonna be sectioned off for your operating system is mine, I'm on Windows, it's saying, hey, go ahead and download Go for Windows. Uh, so if you have Mac, it should tell you how to install it via Mac. And if you have Linux, it should be trying to give you some type of Linux installer. Okay, if you do it, if you're on Windows and you wanna natively stay in Windows, when you click this, it'll give you a walkthrough installer. So I'll actually do that. I'll actually do it, uh, which just feels weird to me. I'm going to do it anyway, because I never, I never saw go on windows. So this, this is super weird. So I'll save it a normal little executable. Like you're probably used to, um, yeah, we're gonna do, we're gonna do WSL in a second. 
and brew should work. There's a slide. If you go forward a slide, uh, yes, you can install it through brew. So right, uh, bro, install go. Uh, go, I think, yes, go laying. I'm pretty sure that will work. But so I just installed it. Oh, I downloaded it. I'm going to click through the installer. I'm just going to click next. I accept. It, I'll leave everything default. It's going to install in program files, and I'm going to do my install here. And it's going to install Go and set the things up that I need for me. So that actually makes it pretty easy uh, for your Windows environment. For Macs, when you do it, it should give you a what's a DMG file. Uh, pretty sure it'll give you a DMG file. So it'll, it should install just like everything else that you're used to. Uh, Linux is going to be the one thing that's a problem. Well, not a problem, but it's going to be different. I'm assuming if you're using Linux right now, you probably are familiar with some of the things that we're going to need to do to install it, but we are about to go through and install it inside of WSL so people can see how that works. And so I installed it there. Um, and now if I open up my command prompt, let's see if it works to test. You're going to type in go space version and hit enter. So I typed in go, I typed in space. I typed in version and I hit enter. So go space version and I hit enter and it says go version, go 1.18.1 windows slash MD 64. If it's not installed, like if I was typing something like go one, uh, if something's not installed, it'll say, Hey, I don't see that thing. I don't understand what that thing is. Uh, it's not here, not recognized. So that's how you know if it, if it's installed correctly. So if you're on windows, there you go. Why exclusively use WSL2 these days? Stupid Twitch uh, reply system. I mean to reply to, oh yeah. But WSL2 is dope uh, for sure. So that'll tell you if it's installed. So Windows users, that MSI will download it for you. You actually don't need to do anything else. You're good to go. For your Mac folks, the DMG should install it right for you. Once it's done, open up your terminal and do this. If you already have a terminal open on Windows or Mac, or Linux, if you already have one open and you installed it and you type in go version and it says, uh, you know, unrecognized or command not found, close your terminal window. So completely close your terminal window and reopen it. Okay. And it should be available to you now. You can use, if you're familiar with any package managers, you can use one of these package managers to install, uh, Install Golang for you, or to install the Go programming language for you. So if you're used to using Brew, which many of you probably are used to using on a Mac, uh, you can do Brew install Golang, and it will install and set it up for you. If you are a Windows user using the Chocolatey Package Manager, you can use Choco install uh, Golang. If you are on Ubuntu or a Debian-based distribution, if you are, you'll know. Apt install Golang-Go is what's going to get uh, is how you're going to get it. Okay, you might be saying, hey, why not Yum? Why didn't you show us how to do it with Yum? Well, Yum, actually, uh, I don't even think Yum packages, it's not even packaged up in Yum. They tell you to install it manually. So now I'm going to show you how you can install it on any system, whether you're on Windows or Mac or, well, really just Windows and Mac OS, I mean, really just Linux and Mac OS. Uh, Windows, it is done the same way, but the locations are a little bit different. Oh yeah, Fedora only has up to 1.16. Same thing, if you're using these package managers, uh, you're gonna have that problem. It's probably gonna be old. It's okay, you don't need the latest version. You don't need the latest version of Go for what we're gonna do in this course. We are learning core programming fundamentals. We're not gonna use anything super fancy from the language, so it's okay. Uh, it's okay that you have the older version. Here is the manual way of install. Here is, if you wanna always grab the latest, uh, here's how you're gonna do it. Uh, to make it work. So Go, what's nice about Go is it is a compiled language. Uh, it's a comp it's a compiled, uh, so Go is a compiled language and the programming language is compiled into a singular uh, binary. So this binary is a, is a file that uh, it can run on any system. It's already been compiled and so you can execute it on any system that it's, that it's aimed at. So uh, when they compile it, they compile one for Windows, they compile one for Linux, they compile one for Mac. And so when you want to use it, all you got to do is just download this, this one file and run it. And, and that's how you run Go. You don't need to install it onto the computer. You just need to have this one executable, this binary executable file. So basically the way you manually install it is you download the binary, you move it to the right place, and then you run it. Uh, that means a couple different things. Today, 
you will uh we're gonna go through it a little bit today you will truly understand what this means next week when we do all the cli stuff uh you'll, you'll you'll understand what this really means to download it to move it to the right place that's really the biggest thing you're going to learn is what does the right place mean uh but you'll move it to the right place and then you will run it so let's do this i'm gonna have to rewatch because you're a little lost like i said absolutely this is usually the install of go is usually where people get lost um so all we're trying to do right now is, is install go and so again if you just go to exclamation point go uh, it should take you to an install page and you're going to want to download it and install it. So the Maze of Raven, what, what, what operating system are you on? Are you on Mac? Are you on PC? Which one are you on? <laughs> also the windows website have an article to unlock full permission security. Yeah. So you're on windows. Awesome. Awesome. So when you click that link, if you click that go, or if you go to go.dev doc install, let me get back over here. It should take you to a, to a page that looks like this. It should take you to a page that looks just like this. You don't need to, you don't need to use any, uh, you don't need to use the terminal right now or anything. All it's going to do is it's going to take you to a page like this. You're just going to click this big button right here that says download for windows. And it's going to download a file somewhere. So if you're using Firefox or something, it might not show you where it downloads to, but it's going to download somewhere. Uh, once it does, you're going to go to your downloads. Maybe you click the little buttons here and go to your downloads or something. Um, uh, but you find out where it downloaded and all you're gonna do is click that file. And once you do, it's going to take you through a little walkthrough and you can just keep hitting next. Uh, you can use all the default options. It's asking me to repair since I already have it installed, but all you're going to do is just keep hitting next until it's installed. Um, and it should, it should just be like two or three windows to do so. Okay. Yeah. All good. All you got to do is once it's downloaded, just click right on that file. It'll take you through the, the click through walkthrough. And that's all you got to do to confirm that it's working to confirm that it installed properly. You're going to open up a command prompt or PowerShell. So I'm going to hit the windows key and type in command prompt. And all you got to do, you don't got to do anything else. You just type in go space version. And if it's installed, it is going to give you some information like this. It's going to give you some type of, uh, so say go version and the actual version of go. If it's not installed, it'll say something like this. It'll say something like go is not a rec is not recognized as an internal or external command. Um, and so that's what you're going to do. Just open up command prompt. So wait, wait to open up the command prompt until it's fully installed. If you do before that, it may not load into, uh, into the command prompt, uh, properly. Perfect. And if anyone else is having any issues, feel free, speak up. We'll, uh, you know, we have time to, to let you work through it because again, like I said, I teach a go bridge course. This always takes for this part takes forever. Uh, cause sometimes perfect. The Mason Raven, you're good. You're good to go. You should feel like a software engineer. That's you. You did it. You did it. Excellent. Uh, but this part always takes this takes the longest. Everyone's computer is different. Sometimes people's computers has stuff that's that prevents them from installing things. Uh, it can be, you know, it can be all kinds of stuff that can go wrong. Sometimes it'll fail, and you think it's something you're doing wrong, but it's. Again, something that the computer has set up on it, all, all kinds of stuff. So don't be afraid to, to let us know if you're having some issues. All right. So I'm going to show you how to install it on, uh, to, to manually install it. This is going to be, this is going to feel a little bit advanced for a lot of people. It's okay. Again, next class, you'll start to understand what we're doing when I'm doing the things that I'm doing to get this installed. So, uh, if you're on Linux, I could install it with, uh, with apt or yum. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do the manual install. And again, the manual install is to download it, to move it to the right place and to run it. So here is what I'm going to do. If you click Linux here, it'll tell you how to do it again. You can actually do this in Macs too. Um, you can do it in windows too, if you know where the right place is, but I'm going to do it uh, right here. The first thing download it. How do we download it? It's not letting me install the Linux file on Chrome. Correct. It's not going to let you, if you're running Chrome, it's not going to let you run 
go uh, inside, execute go right inside of Chrome. You are going to need to use something else. If I were you, uh, like I said, you have a couple options. Either GitHub, uh, GitHub. What, what's the what's the GitHub thing called? I already forgot. <laughs> code Spaces. Either GitHub Code Spaces, Repl.it, or the Go Playground. So play, uh, go.dev slash play. You can go there as well. I typically use Chocolatey in my PowerShell Windows. Yeah, to get certain programs, one hundred percent. Um, <laughs> like I like the name. Um, yeah, you can you can do that as well. That it's listed right here. Choco install Golang, and you can make it happen. Ooh, Chrome OS productivity term. Ooh, fancy. Fa uh, also, what's up, Managed Chaos? Shout out. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming through. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we're doing the Linux stuff. Let's do it. My mind is going. Okay, cool. Because this computer is not my, because this computer is so bare, it's a new install. Uh, I'm forgetting some of the stuff. So I'm actually going to do this in, do I have Windows Terminal installed? Yeah. So Windows Terminal is dope. If you don't have Windows Terminal, uh, I would grab it from the store. Like just open up Windows Store and type in Terminal. The Windows Terminal is a great terminal app. Uh, that you can use. You can use it for PowerShell, you can use it for Command Prompt, and you can use it for Linux. So what I'm gonna do is, this is PowerShell, I'm gonna show you how to do it with Linux. So I'm gonna go into my Linux command line, okay? So if you're using WSL, again, you probably know how to do this already. Uh, it should give you a, com a shell by name, so if you installed Ubuntu, if you go into your apps and look for Ubuntu, it will open up the Ubuntu shell. Uh, so once you get in the shell, this is how we're going to do it. So first things first, here's what you're going to learn. Uh, again, you don't have to, you don't have to, uh, to do this. You don't have to follow this at all. If you already have it installed, you're good to go. But if you want to learn how to do this, you can, you can follow along. And again, it'll make a little bit more sense next time. We are using the command line interface to issue commands to the computer to do the things that we want to do. So first things first, we need to download this thing. Okay. We need to download this package here, uh, but we need to download the one for Linux. How do you download from the command line? Well, there's a couple different options you have. Uh, two really main options. One is a command that's called curl. So I could type in a command called curl. This is generally the easiest one to use. Well, the better one to use because it's going to be available on all pretty much every system. Um, and so it's there. It's ready for me to use. The other one is called wget. Wget is easier to use for most people. Um, and so that's available sometimes on your system. It may not be available, uh, but you know, it's pretty easy to get if you don't have it. We're gonna use wget, okay? So wget is a command that's gonna allow us to download something from the internet. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the link. I'm gonna grab the link for Linux. I'm gonna right click, copy link address. All right, so that's gonna copy the URL to this download right to my uh, clipboard. And all I'm gonna do is go over here and type in wget space, and I'm gonna paste in that link. All right, so it's gonna say, hey, go off and get whatever's at this link. And it's going to give me a bunch of information and it's showing me that it's downloading the file that we want, the go dot, uh, the go one dot 18 dot one Linux dot tar, whatever. So if I do, and if I look at what files are available to me, this file is right here. It is, uh, it's in an archive format, so it's it's zipped up. So if you ever use a zip file before, this is like a zip file right here. And so I've got to I've got to unzip it up, and I've got to move it to where I want to move it to. And so this actually tells me how to install it. So I downloaded it already. This tells me the command to get it going. So we'll break this down in a second. I'm gonna paste it, and I'll show you what each piece means. And again. The goal right now, this is not what we're learning today, okay? I'm doing this for you. You're getting to see it, but it's gonna it might, it's gonna make you feel confused because we haven't done any command line stuff yet. So don't worry about it. What you're seeing here, this command is long. This is a command that they're giving us to remove the old version of Go and install the new version of Go. So what they're doing here is first, here is, let me move this bar. All right, so 
This is the command. This is the first command. So there's this, whoops. There's this RM right here. Let me change the color to something like the blue. There's this RM right here. This it stands for remove. So it's actually gonna remove the file that's located at this location. So this is where Go would be on your computer if you had installed it by default before. So it's gonna first remove that file. And then it's gonna, this and and says, hey, after you're done with that file, after you're done with the first command, as long as it completes successfully, go ahead and run the next command. This command right here, this command basically unzips the file that we have. Remember I said it's like a zip file. This whole command says, hey, unzip it for me. Take it, unzip it for me and so that I have all the files and things that I need, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll skip it over the flags. Uh, but yeah, the RF right here says recursively and force. So basically it's saying remove everything from the, the, the from the location that you said and below and force remove it. I don't care if there's something in it, just get rid of it no matter what. Uh, so be careful if you do a dash F, we'll talk about these flags. And then again, like I said, this tar command just unzips this whole long command. Uh, but once we dive into some command line stuff, or if you wanna learn this more, again, join the seven week class. Uh, on Thursdays, Thursdays we're learning all about Linux for the for the next six weeks. You know, our first week was last week. Um, it'll teach you more about what's going on here. It's an amazing thing to know. It's an amazing tool to have, and it's actually, to, in my opinion, it's pretty easy to uh, it's pretty easy to do. That RM dangerous. It is. It is. So when I run this, it actually is giving me a bunch of errors. Okay, uh, it's actually saying, hey. Uh, cannot open, no such file directory, permission denied. What this is doing is saying, hey, you actually don't have permission to do what you're trying to do. The reason is because I didn't, uh, if you've ever had to, sometimes in Windows, uh, you'll, you'll try to do something and a little shield will pop up at the bottom and you'll have to go in and click accept. Uh, or you might have to right click something and run it as administrator. And that's what's happening here, saying, hey, you're making changes to something that you don't have access to make changes to. So what you'll do, is simply type in uh, after the and and after this ampersands right here. And actually, you might need it for both, um, but I don't have go installed. You just put a sudo s u d o. This stands for super user do. It says, hey, act like you're the administrator. Escalate your privileges to the administrator uh, um, permissions. It's gonna tell you to type in your password. And when I hit enter, I no longer get those permissions uh, permission errors. So now. We are all, uh, we're, we're, om we're almost all done. Okay, so over here, we downloaded the binary and I actually didn't put unzip on here, but we, we downloaded it um, and we've almost moved it to the right place. We haven't, we haven't necessarily moved it to the right place. Uh, if user local works for you, then it already is in the right place. And so let's find out. The way that we know for sure is to type in go version and it says it can't find it, but I just did it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close my window just to be sure, and I'm gonna open it back up. We already have Go running on the Windows side, but this is Linux. So I'm gonna type in Go version. All right, and so it's not working, okay? And the reason why it's not working, again, something we'll talk about next time, is because it's not where it needs to be. That's why That's why I said move it to the right place. The right place is what matters here. Uh, and so it needs to be in a place that the computer can read, uh, can read from. So when I type in Go, it knows that Go is available and listening. And so what this did is it unzipped it into uh, user local Go, uh, but do not untar an existing user local Go. Well, yeah, add user local Go bin to the path variable. And so they give you a command here to do so. So you can simply copy the command right here. This will uh, make sure your computer knows where Go was installed at. And so I'm going to do that. And I'm gonna type in Go version. And would you look at that? Now it works. The issue with this, this is this is all the Linux stuff that gets confusing. This is what a lot of developers run into when they get into their first job. Uh, they run into command line stuff and things that they just don't know how to work through, completely okay. 
It's a skill that you'll learn. Again, it, I promise you, this stuff is easier than the actual programming process. Uh, well, command line stuff. Installing Go can be a little bit difficult. Um, but it, it is now working. If I actually close this out and, and open it up again, it will not work. It doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because every time you, the reason we had to close down our terminal uh, after we install stuff to get it working is because things get loaded into the terminal when you uh, when you start it up. So when you start up, a bunch of stuff gets loaded in and that's what you have available to you. If you want to use something else that you've now added, you have to actually load that stuff in basically. When we did this export command, it actually loaded, it actually loaded this into something called our path. That doesn't matter right now. All you need to know is that when I ran this command, it said, hey computer, when this person types in go, uh, go look in this, go look in this folder to see if it's available. Okay, that, that's basically what this command did. But it is a temporary export. It needs to go somewhere permanent. Uh, for now, um, to fix this, we can put this into a file that will kind of make it permanent, a file that will that'll get this loaded in uh, immediately. Uh, well, sorry, we'll get this loaded in when, this, when the terminal starts. Um, the... <sighs> This is we're going we're going much deeper than I want to go, uh, but if you type in this command, if you, if you're having the same problem that I'm having, uh, again, you're probably familiar with Linux. This is specifically for people who are you know uh, already a little bit familiar with Linux. The place the file that you need to put this in depends on what shell you're using. If you're using a Mac, uh, you're probably using ZSH because they've switched to ZSH as their default shell. Right now, I'm using Bash. So for Bash, the file that I can put this in is I can go echo. Uh, I can paste in the command and I can put it into, uh, this tilde slash dot bash RC. All right. What this what this command is doing? You don't have to worry about this at all, but the command, the, the command echo, this says, Hey, just kind of repeat out loud. Repeat out loud, uh, spit out in the terminal exactly what I type after this. So echo just says, spit it back out. And then so I'm basically telling it to spit out this stuff right here. And this little section here says, hey, redirect the output into another place. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna redirect it into this file. These these RC files are run, they're called run command files. They're, they're hidden, they're hidden files. And basically every time my terminal gets loaded, this file gets read. If you're using a different shell, Jo again, join the Linux class if you want to know about shells. Uh, depending on what shell you're using, it uses a different file for these things. And so if I do this, now when I exit and I load this back up, if I did it properly, ah, which looks like I might not have done it properly, uh, didn't work, so I'm going to. I probably don't have Vim installed, but I might. Vim, let me go look at that file. Why didn't it like that? Microsoft Valid Identifier Files, Microsoft. Oh, it threw some. It threw some extra. Ah, so that, ooh, Anthony writes code. Welcome to the channel. Good to see you. Well, this is good because we're actually about to live troubleshoot some pathing issues, but we don't really need to, but uh, we're gonna do that. Anthony writes code. Welcome, welcome. If you all want to learn from somebody really smart, uh, thanks for coming through. Uh, let me give you a shout out. And I think, I think you ran this last week, so people should be following you. Definitely give them a follow. But what were you doing today over on the Anthony Rice Code channel? Welcome all of the Anthony Rice coders uh, to the channel. We're just uh, we're getting our development environment set up. So if you're new to coding, uh, you're going to be learning a little bit today about uh, one. We just got Go installed. Um, now we're installing Go manually. So we're learning a little bit of command line stuff. Next week, we're going to be diving deeper into the command line and making sure we understand what's going on here. Uh, but if you want to learn that stuff, you know, hang out with us. Hang out with us. Uh, let's see. 
me go back into my path. Let me look at my path, actually. Ah, it doesn't. Oh, it. So actually, this is interesting. This is actually interesting. So I, 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 I. Hmm. I'll see program, but that is not what's in here. Bash RC. Okay, so we're exporting our path here. It doesn't like something that I added, which was probably all of this at the end here. So I'm just gonna move it. Looks like a uh, quoting issue. Yeah. Yes. I think you're right. One of having spaces and components. Yeah. Uh, but why did it? Why did it put? Step us all. User local bin. Uh, user local go bin. User local go bin. I wonder why user local go bin is in there twice. Um, can I just can I just quote the whole thing? Or do I have to quote each of them? Do I have to quote each of them? Bin. One of them is S bin. Neither one's S bin. Use local bin go. Use local bin go. Is one of those S bin? Explain the path in your echo command instead of writing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, no. Explain the path. No, I didn't. I didn't type path in my uh, echo command. Export path. User local. Yeah. So so. Uh, chat for everyone who's not who's not. Uh, well, let's not do what we're doing right now. So uh, there are a number of ways to do to achieve the same thing in Linux. So uh, normally I could add to my I could add to my path variable by simply uh, uh, well not by simply there there are a number of ways to add to your path variable. Uh, I was taking the lazy way out and providing an export providing a lazy export to my path to be run every single time uh, bash loaded. So my normal path variable wouldn't actually be uh, wouldn't actually be what I wanted it to be. It would be normally set and then every time i loaded this up i would add new things to it which isn't really the right way to do things just try to do it quickly for you all uh let's see usually go export path you don't need to enumerate everything your echo command expanded path instead of writing path but my echo command didn't have path in it oh yes it did yes it did thank you thank you got it so you're saying do this and then go back out Rerun my export command and can I just quote it? And it did it again. Which still won't work, right? Hmm. Okay. Okay, got it. You're right. Uh, not soft quotes, hard quotes, not soft quotes. Uh, Elf and Rod, why? That's from that's 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 for me. That's for me. That's that's for me asking why. Just play export to bash RC. Yes, you can also do that too, but it works. I created a Go workspace folder for handling the Go SDK and package for handling. Added that as the source. The path is no longer dynamic. If it changes, uh, you overwrite path. Every okay, perfect. That is helpful. That's good to know. And yeah, I should just place it in here, but I'm going to keep doing the, uh, you know, it's just more fun this way. It's just more fun. Uh, Harcos literally right path uh, without expanding it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well,
cool. And if we have problems, um, I like I if we have problems, I know how to fix the problem. I was trying to save some time. Uh, and the, you, whenever you try to save time, this is always how it goes. Okay, so we're messing around with the command line. As you can see, it can be very intimidating. I, I input a lot of different commands, uh, but it actually gets very comfortable very, very quickly. The good thing about the command line is when we learn all the code, when we learn how to code, everything's gonna feel super duper abstract. Everything's gonna feel very, very weird. Uh, you're, you're gonna be, again, you're gonna be learning how to use a tool and it's gonna make sense. It's gonna make sense how to use the tool, uh, but it's not gonna make sense how to apply it. So it can be pretty tough. What's nice about the command line and what's nice about Linux is right now you're watching someone who has lots of years of experience working in the command line do things relatively quickly. I'm, I'm, I already told y'all, I'm not the most amazing engineer in the world at all, uh, but I've done this stuff for a long time. So I know my way around the command line pretty well. Um, so when you see me do stuff, you can't say, oh my gosh, I look super hard uh, because I'm doing a bunch of stuff that you know, that I probably don't need to do. Uh, and again, there's, I have muscle memory already developed for a lot of these things. Um, but this is what, again, what we're gonna be diving into next week, a little bit of command line stuff. Uh, the more you know about the command line, the easier it is gonna be for you to do your job. There are rules here. There are things that make sense. And again, it's much easier to follow than you think. You're gonna, you're gonna feel like a pro after one more class, one more class, you're gonna feel, you're gonna start to really feel like you're learning a lot and that you can do some really cool things and you will be able to do some cool things. Uh, so all we want to do is just get go installed. So now we have go installed. I also have go installed over here on the window side of things. Uh, so I could use either one trial and error. Worst case scenario, close your terminal, reopen it back up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but, but one, the, the, so I have like 13 questions. I'm going to save them. And I'm actually going to whisper some of you all because I have, I have some questions about a few things. But cool, let's keep it going. So, what time is it? Let's take a let's take a, a five minute bathroom break. My alarm didn't go off. Oh, it's going off silently. So take five minutes. We'll we'll start back up at eight oh seven. I'll feel free to ask questions if you need to ask questions during this time. I'm not going anywhere. But take a five minute break uh, to step away if you need to step away for water. Bathroom break whatever, and then we'll dive into actually running some Go code. Uh, we're gonna get VS Code installed next, and we'll talk about, we'll go through a whole uh, tutorial with VS Code and a whole little tour of it uh, before we learn how to run stuff. Yeah, silent alarms are my, are my, they're my favorite. Like why, why was it silent? That didn't make any sense. Cool. Um. So another reason why we're actually, why I'm, this is actually another reason why I'm actually using Windows. Uh, for this class, people always ask me why. Cause I used to use Linux to do all this stuff. Uh, another reason I use Windows is because I can show it to you and easily show it to you with two different uh, operating systems. Uh, so, you know, that makes it a little bit easy. I could run a VM and show it to you. Like I could run Mac and show it to you in all three by running VMs. A little bit weird. Not something I want to, uh, <laughs> not something I want to fight with. I have, I have bad, I have bad, Type two hypervisor luck. VirtualBox always causes problems for me. Always, every time. And how do I still have a VIP? I don't even remember why I got it. Doesn't matter. You deserve it. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you very much. You know, still still doing the moving thing. It's super weird being a homeowner. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. The house is a little bit scary as well. Uh, so trying to get used to it at nighttime. Beautiful during the day, scary at night. <laughs> so trying to, get, uh, trying to get used to it. But it's good. Good do this. I'm great. I'm great. I hope you're doing well as well. How you doing? VirtualBox works great for me. So you know what I think it is? So I think ever since it, it used to work well for me, I think now that like all of the initially WSL did not work. Uh, WSL needed no, no, Docker, Docker, either Docker or WSL or both needed Hyper-V installed uh, to be able to run properly. And then uh, that meant VirtualBox couldn't work because that's how it worked before. Hyper-V, uh, you know, it wouldn't work if Hyper-V was installed. Then they did some stuff and now you can get them to work together. Um, you get them to work together, they both can work. But ever since all that happened, uh, I feel like I've had nothing but issues with VirtualBox. I try to do all of this. And like, I, I even try to set up a whole sandbox environment for the stream. Like that's what I wanted to do since I have a powerful computer. Uh, but man, who it is, it, it takes forever to start up for some reason. Um, I have a lot of 
I, I've got a lot of little issues that are very, very annoying. Very annoying. Um, so yeah, I use Docker containers, plain and simple. Yeah, and again, I do I, I do actually prefer Linux uh, for most things. Um, if I had to do a development project, like I would just install Linux on this, uh, on here and just go to work. But uh, I do other things, which makes it tough. So VirtualBox doesn't work. Yeah, the same way I don't use WSL problem. Yes, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, if you don't know about, if you don't know where our VODs are, our VODs have moved to a new place. So yes, you can still get them here on Twitch for 60 days, uh, but they're no longer on the normal mastermind YouTube. They're actually on a VODs channel, uh, specifically for playback, uh, mostly to separate the type of content. So the, the videos are muddied. Um, yeah, so if you're not following that channel, go ahead and follow it. If you think you might wanna uh, watch some of these afterwards. Would I have to use VirtualBox on my Mac for Go? Sorry, I was late to stream today. No, uh, at Random Gemini, you do not have to do that at all. Actually, all you have to do uh, at Random Gemini, are you uh, a Brew user? Do you use Brew on your computer? Because if you do, all you gotta do is type in Brew install uh, Golang-Go. Yes, uh, so you can just use Brew for that. It's actually, the command is actually in the slides. Uh, for, for doing that, I think it's brew install golang dash go, or just golang, maybe brew install golang. Uh, so you don't have to install it manually if you don't want to, or you can click uh, that go dev doc install link, and I think it'll give you a DMG to install, uh, and that'll make it easy. But nope, on a Mac, pretty easy to do. All right. 807, cool. Now we're gonna get to the fun part. I think this part's a little bit more fun, personally. So once you have Go installed, uh, that's great. Now that we have, the, we have the programming language installed, we have the programming runtime installed. So now when we actually write code, we can actually run it, okay? Uh, but you know, how did I do it right? But now, how do we write the code? We don't we don't have a way to write the code currently. We talked about it a little bit last time. Uh, how do we actually get the code written? Well, that is where text editors and IDEs came in. So what is a text editor? Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. Code is simply text. Nothing special, just text. Uh, how do we create text? Well, a text editor. We use a text editor to edit and to modify and to create text. Text editors are exactly what they sound like, a program that has tools and features to help you create and edit text. Microsoft uh, Microsoft Word, it's it's a rich text editor, but it's a text editor. Uh, so Microsoft Word, Google Docs, those are text editors. They help you edit text. So you've probably used a text editor before. Notepad is a text editor. Notepad++, a text editor. But usually when we're talking about text editors in terms of programming, we are talking about a specific type of tool uh, that actually has tools and features uh, inside of it that help that are gonna help us develop code faster, okay? So text editors are what they sound like. They allow us to edit text. Uh, they have tools to help us edit text quickly. There are also things called IDEs. These are called integrated development environments. So you won't hear, you won't, you don't quite hear this as much nowadays for a number of reasons, which we're about to talk about, but what is an IDE? What is an integrated development environment? Well, it's really a text editor with a collection of tools and features uh, built into it that make uh, make it much, much easier to create and work with code. Usually uh, an IDE is focused on a specific development tool or runtime or, you know, programming language. Um, and so generally, you know, back in the day, these were, you know, larger programs that had every, all the stuff you needed to be able to work with something. If you wanted to work with Java, if you wanted to work with C++, it'd have all of the things that you needed to make it as easy as possible. So usually the learning curve is a little bit higher because there's lots and lots of tools for you to use, but it's got all the stuff that you need. Nowadays, um, text editors have become much closer to IDEs uh, than we think. You can actually build up your text editors now into uh, to work how you want them to work. And so you can really turn them almost into full-blown IDEs. And so, you know, there are people who still use IDEs. JetBrains, if you've heard of company JetBrains, they make IDEs for all kinds of different languages. They have a different IDE for anything you want to use. If you want to use theirs for Go, it's called GoLand, I believe. Uh, 
yeah for for jet brains and so it has a bunch of tools specific to helping you be able to develop code but it is a text editor um just with, with a bunch of tools attached so i told you we're going to be using vs code what is vs code well it's a text editor so it is a text editor it's not an ide uh, it's a text editor uh, but it, again, you can build it to provide an experience much like an IDE. So it's a text editor that comes with all the tools that you need to be able to run code, to be able to work with code. It's got a lot of tools built right into it, um, but it doesn't have every single thing you would ever need, uh, but you have access to pretty much everything you would ever need. Uh, there is a extension system. There's a, there's a way to grab new pieces and make your VS code much more powerful than it already is, or much more useful to the thing that you're trying to do. What's nice about this is, instead of having to have a different IDE for, you know, let's say you were learning Python, then you were learning Go, then you were learning JavaScript. Uh, so instead of having to have multiple ones, you have one editor that you can grab all the tools for to work exactly for you. Okay, so VS Code's pretty dope. Um, it is created by Microsoft. We talked about that last time too. Um, it's open source, so you can get it on Mac, Linux, and PC, no problem. <laughs> And again, it's, it's an Electron app. So if you didn't know, Electron is a uh, JavaScript framework actually that allows you to create desktop applications or GUI applications. Uh, you know, it's one of the best, you know, people will feel how they feel about Electron applications. Uh, I think they're cool, but uh, sometimes. I think they're cool as someone who uses Linux, who's had app compatibility issues. I like that Electron makes things a little bit more uh, useful cross-platform, but uh, sometimes it can make things slow, but it's, it's a very good Electron app. And again, it's become the it's become easily the most popular, uh, very like very quickly the most popular uh, text editor out there because uh, it's a pretty late it's a pretty it's late to the game it's it's a newcomer. Uh, there's been a bunch out before. We talked about Sublime. We talked about Atom. All those things are great. You can actually use whatever text editor you want. If you're familiar with something else, it's completely okay to do that. Um, but you know, you won't know if we do something special or shortcuts or something, you're kind of on your own there if you decide to use something different, but they all, they all kind of have everything built in, uh, but made by Microsoft uh, and honestly, one of Microsoft's best products for sure. The only text editor I'm familiar with is Notepad. Notepad's great, no, well, Notepad++ is great. Notepad's pretty good for just taking notes, you know, that's what it's for, Notepad. I strongly recommend, uh, yes, a magnetized needle and a steady hand. That makes sense, you know, makes sense. Adam used to be uh, a lot of people's favorite. I never liked Adam. It was always slow on my machines and I didn't use it for a long time because it was so slow. Then someone told me to try it again and it was pretty good. Um, but yeah, support is lacking. And now that Microsoft owns Adam because they own GitHub, uh, it's gonna lack even more <laughs> because yeah. JetBrain, yeah. JetBrains is cool. I actually really like JetBrains um, products. I really do. Like if I'm actually building a real like large application, I, I do like to, I like to use an IDE for some of those things. Electron is cool, but slow. Exactly. And the VS Code extensions are fantastic. Yep. What were people using before VS Code? So I was using Sublime. I'm one of the few people who have, who actually have a Sublime text. Uh, I, I paid for it. So all of you people who are using it for years and didn't pay for it, your fault. It's your fault. And now the people are, you know, they can't feed their families because of you. It's like, it's a it's a freemium product. Uh, but I used to use Sublime Text. A lot of people used to use Sublime Text 3. They're now up to four. It's a pretty good product uh, for sure. Main difference between text editors and IDEs just has to do with um, the amount of, in my experience, the amount of tools that are, that are built in by default. So IDs usually give you everything. They usually have everything built right in, uh, you know, built right in so that you can get started and have access to everything. Text editors are usually much more bare bones. And again, nowadays, because of extensions and things, you can create the experience that you want. You can add a lot of those tools in, but that didn't used to be the case. Things like Notepad++, you kind of had a, it was pretty lightweight in comparison, didn't have all the crazy tools, uh, but you could still get stuff done. Uh, you still can get some st stuff done, but IDEs just have a lot more uh, tooling uh, built inside of them to help you out. Uh, I. I will try to tell Microsoft to bring Mr. Clippy back. I, that would make me happy as well. Got Bash working on Hyper Terminal. I'm a big fan of Hyper Terminal. 
uh, because it does some cool stuff like shooting off rockets when you push stuff to get and landing rockets when you pull stuff from Git. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out, check out Hyper Terminal. I think the website is hyper.is, I think, uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, did I also pay for WinRoar? No. <laughs> Win, WinRoar is like the one the one thing I've used constantly and I, I just, I can't do it. I can't, and, I pay, and, and I'm a big fan. Like I, I pay for, I pay for all the, like I'll pay just because I know what it's like to build software. And like if I use it once and it's helpful, I will, I will pay. I'm not paying for WinRoar, I'm not doing it. Feel bad about paying, <laughs> about not paying for Sublime. Uh, I don't feel bad about paying, not paying for WinRoar. I don't know why. I don't know why. I paid for Sublime SFT, SFTP plugin, but never paid for Sublime. That's fair. Oh yes, the rockets. The ro I'll show you. I'll show y'all a little bit later. I'll show you how to make the uh, the rockets happen. I think I think one of them is called Git Rocket. Let's see. Actually, Git Rocket. Yeah. No, not Gift Rocket. Git. Look at this. I know they have. Yeah. Let's check this out. Yeah. Look at that's that's cool. And then there's ones that land. You can make you can make SpaceX rockets. You can do all kinds of stuff because this is just a Electron JavaScript thing, and you know you can make all the fancy stuff happen. <laughs> you know it is the first time I, the first time I saw it, I was like this. The reason I started it, I, the reason I started using Hyper was because I saw somebody push something to get and this rocket shot off, and I said I cannot do any work until I make this happen. Like this is what I need in my life to be a successful developer. Uh, and I will not work any, anymore until I make it happen. And I spent like 40 minutes like learning how to use Hyper just so I could make it happen. And I got frustrated because once I made it happen, I didn't have anything to push to GitHub. So I had to make a whole repo and, you know, super annoying, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely necessary. I agree. I agree. I definitely agree. All right. So. Lots of different options for text editors, lots of different options for IDEs, but right now, one focus. VS Code is all you need to get going. So exclamation point VS Code should take you to the VS Code install page. VS Code you can install, there's no fancy installs stuff. It's like any other application that you've used on your computer, okay? You don't need to do it, it gives you an installer. It'll give you an installer to download. And you know, you pick your operating system and it, it's, it's built for everything. Even if you have a, uh, an M one Mac, um, and you download it. So I already have it installed, but you just, you just download it. You click it, it'll download and you simply click through the installer and it works. I'm going to accept. I'm just going to reinstall it next, next. I'll leave everything as default. If you want a desktop icon, click it or don't. Next, install. What's really nice about this is for Windows users, if you are using WSL2, it has really good WSL2 integrations uh, to make things super duper easy. You don't have to do anything special. It kind of works right out of the box with it. Yeah, you can also do a brew command squared mode. Thank you so much for pasting. Uh, that in there, I think they listed, they might list it, uh, somewhere else too, uh, like in the, in the install docs, but go ahead and do your best. Take a, take a minute or two to try to get VS code installed on your computer so we can talk through VS code, what it is and how we're going to use it because it's a pretty dope product. Yeah, we're gonna hop right into it. What does homebrew mean? Great question. These, I love this. I I love, I love questions like this because uh, it, it's always interesting. Like you get surrounded by so much tech, you start talking about things, and you for sometimes you forget that I should explain these things. Let's talk about these things uh, as you get further and further. But yes, homebrew is a package manager uh, for for Mac for Mac OS. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to easily install, you know, upgrade, 
all that stuff. It allows you to manage uh, pieces of software. So rather than having to go off to every single website and download something and try to get it installed individually, it gives you one nice, easy way to get stuff installed. Uh, so basically a bunch of people maintain packages inside of there and you know they keep it uh, all up to date and stuff or as up to date as possible. And it makes it easy. So now you can use this brew program to, to, you, to install everything. Anything you want to install, you can kind of use brew to do. And so now, you don't have to figure out how to install Go and how to install VS Code and how to install this other thing. You can just do brew, install, Golang. Brew, install, VS Code. And so you do gotta look up or search uh, on the brew website what the name is that you gotta download. Um, but yeah, it's pretty easy to do so. Uh, there is one for Windows. Uh, Windows has a new one. It's in beta right now called Winget, which is pretty cool. Um, but there's a one that, you, that everybody can use called chocolatey. Yes. You just windows has it, but you just have to, you have to install it though. Um, so it's called chocolatey and it is helpful. So chocolatey is, is pretty good. Um, I, I, I'm a fan of it for sure. Um, so it's just chocolatey.org. And they give you a one little one little command to get it installed, and then you can do stuff like if I go to no, not chocolate for business main. Where can I find packages? If I type in something like I accept, I understand. If I type in something like VS Code, I'll then be able to install VS Code with Chaco install VS Code, which is nice. Makes it super easy. So if I want to install anything, it's just Chaco install, and I just have to find the name of the package on Chaco's website. There's a way to search for it as well, um, but it does make it easy. Yes, Guermo is the goat for commands. Yes, the more and more, the more and more commands you know, you know, it, the easier it is. Also, there's a lot of patterns, uh, and so like the more and more you know, the like take a look at what you're actually copying and pasting because it'll start to get easier to just know what commands to try and what commands to do uh, because everything follows, most things follow a certain pattern. All right, so once you got VS Code installed, all you gotta do is go to your applications and start it up. So, uh, you know, I like to type everything in, but yeah, you just start it up and you should get a window like this. And you'll get greeted with a getting started page that looks like this. The first time you open up, it might actually give you some other pop-ups and stuff, but open, open up the program. And let's start taking a look at what we have here. You should install WSL two slow, like Fox, uh, WSL two is way better than WSL. And I'm not actually sure. I think if you just install WSL, I think it does two by default. Now I think you gotta do some, I think it installs both of them, and then you can like specify which one if you need to. But I think it does everything with WSL2 by default right now. All right, so this in, this starting this intro page is pretty cool. Um, it gives you some easy ways to get started. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So one, choose the look you want. This is the my this is my favorite part of. VS code and text editors period. Uh, if you want to perform well, if you want to be able to, a real developer, you got to care about the theme. You got to care about what it looks like. Got to look good to feel good, all that other stuff. Uh, and so choose the look you want. The first thing they have you do is choose a color theme. The default color theme is fine, uh, but uh, you can choose a different color theme. So you can browse more color themes. And so I can see, you know, the ones that are installed, I can see what it looks like. We can always get more color themes, so you don't have to you don't have to choose one of these right now. Um, I'll show you how to get more, and I'll show you what my favorite ones are as well. I change mine up pretty often though, so I'll leave it on. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it on this this normal one right now. Team Dracula, Dracula on everything. Amazing Raven, we we're best friends. We're best friends. We're best friends. Dracula is my. I switch up stuff all the time. Dracula on everything now is my is my go to. Like I, it's the one that sticks. It's the one that I like the most. Uh, I used to go heavily. I used to be a big Monokai user. I like different Monokai uh, fonts. I mean uh, color schemes, but Dracula is the best. It's the best, one hundred percent the best. 
I probably got the dopest color theme and cursive writing uh, for the text. Now the cursive writing sounds very difficult to use, but I love it. Hey, if it works again, you got to look good to feel good. I'm all about fonts and all that other stuff. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share. I, so I have a Linux. I have a Linux video with all of my customizations and stuff coming out. It's supposed to come out tomorrow. I'm not 100 percent sure I'll be done by tomorrow. If not, it'll come out Wednesday. Um, so this week you'll actually see if you don't know how to edit all this stuff. If you don't know how if you don't know what we're talking about, which you probably don't, you'll you will know or you can know uh, very, very soon. So check it all out if you want uh, there. Then it gives you a bunch of other options. Sync from other devices, uh, all this other stuff. Not a big deal. You don't need to do any of this. It's just giving you a little starter walkthrough if you need it. Uh, we don't need to go through this walkthrough right now because we don't need to use any of this stuff. What you can do is you can you can leave this up. Feel free to leave this up. Uh, or you can click this little X right here. So I'm gonna click this X to get it away so I can start to show you VS Code and what its different pieces are. So VS Code, a text editor. It has tools to make it easier for you to edit text. So let's walk through what you're seeing on this screen and actually let me, uh, let me windows tab it. Windows tab, let's move it to windows tab. There we go. Let me move it to my second desktop so that we can go back and forth between this and the slides. All right, our walkthrough. Legendary dark is great. Legendary dark is really good. Uh, the activity bar. Let's talk about the activity bar. Now, no one knows, no one who uses the VS Code knows what these things are called. I actually had to look up the anatomy of this stuff because I didn't know what to call these things. Uh, but this right here is the activity bar. Let me get a let me get a decent color over here. What's happening? Oh, it's upside down. That's why. Um, let me erase. And let's use. Let's use this blue. So this right here, this is the activity bar. This thing right here. Okay. It allows you to choose what activity I guess that you're trying to do. All right. Uh, and here's what these things are. Uh, it is important to know what these different icons are. You can actually end up with more icons depending on what extensions you install, but these will always be here. This one is your Explorer tab. All right, and so if we click it, what does that mean? Well, this opens up your file explorer. So on Windows or in Mac, you know, if you're looking through your files, it allows you to see your directory structure. It allows you to, to navigate the folders on your computer, okay? It allows you to explore the file system. All right, and so when I click it right now, it says, hey, you don't actually have any folders open. All right, so no folders open. I can click this to open up a folder if I would like. If I open up a folder or if I start the program with an open folder, I will have, uh, it'll show those files in here. So let me actually, I'm gonna open up a folder really quick. I'm gonna open up a random folder. I don't really have any code on here, but I'm gonna open up my documents, okay? I'm gonna open up my documents folder. And it's gonna ask me about trusting these things. This is a Windows, a new Windows thing, I think. You can just click, yes, you can you can do that. An anonymous share, thank you so much for the anonymous share. Thank you so much for the one bit. Somebody gave me some bits before. Hold on, I'm sorry about that. I was trying to stay on track, but I gotta go back and say thank you. Uh, Real Abja, thank you so much for the 200 bits. You're the best, I appreciate the support. Thank you. All right, so. If you look here, I opened up my documents folder and now it's got some other things in here. My music, my pictures, my videos, but I don't really have anything in here. So it, it's not really showing what I wanted to show. And actually I'm surprised that it's, that these things are inside of my documents. Uh, kind of weird. Uh, but again, this will show your files in your folders. Let me actually open up something different. Um, it's so, it, it's so interesting because I'm not, a, I'm not, I use VS code a little bit, uh, but I, I don't use it. A, I don't use it a ton. So how do I new folder? No, no, I don't want to create a new folder. I want to open up. Uh, I want to open up somewhere else. Uh, let's say open folder. So let's open up our. Nah, I guess documents is fine. I'll leave documents open. We'll create some stuff in here in a second. But that's what this is where. 
this right here is where it'll show your files in your folder. So everything you want to see is going to be right here. Next down, the next thing down, this is your search bar. Okay. This is where you're going to do all of your searching from. And it works very, very well. So it allows you to find anything and everything that you need to find. Where does it search? You want to know where it searches from? It searches from everything that's open in your explore uh, window. So like whatever folders you have open here, it will search inside of all of those things. It'll search down recursively down into whatever folder you have open right here. Okay. So that's what it'll search. It's not gonna search your whole computer unless you have the root of your computer opened. It'll search whatever's open in your Explorer is it'll search for whatever term, whatever you're looking for, it'll search for. What's nice about this is also that you get uh, to do some fancy things like case sensitive searches and you can do some regular expressions and all kinds of stuff to make your searching easier. Not only can you search, but you can find and replace. It'll show you every single instance of, of those things and you can click right into here to get to where you want to go. It's super helpful. An anonymous gifter, thank you so much for providing Emacs a tier, a tier one sub. I love it. I love it right on time because uh, we didn't talk about Emacs at all, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing my best, so I'm glad I'm glad it's, it's working out for you. Uh, easily offended millennial. Um, yeah, so this is what the search, this is what search is going to do. Again, it's going to search everything that's in here. Uh, and so it's helpful. It'll get very helpful when you're working with projects that have lots and lots of files. This makes it super easy. You don't have to memorize where things are. You can search for terms. You can search for files, all that stuff right there. All right, next. We have the git uh, searches from the directory. It searches. Yes, it searches from uh, wherever you are, whatever you have opened uh, in the Explorer window. So right now, if I were to search, it would start searching in the documents folder uh, and it would go recursively down into each of these folders, into my music, into my pictures, into my videos. It'll go down into all of those things uh, and it'll keep searching amongst all of that. So whatever's open in your Explorer window is what this search icon will start to search through. Let's see, pro tip, if you right click the activity bar and move primary sidebar right, it will move to the right of the screen, YGBSM. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, that. So it's weird. It's weird because I'm not. It's different. I think I would really pr prefer this. I, I would really prefer this. This is great. Without constantly moving your code window. Thank you. That's actually very, very helpful. Very helpful. Man, I like that. I like that a lot. That's yeah. For anyone confused why the documents folder has phantom folders in it, it's probably because you have OneDrive installed. Yes, Zader, 100%. That is exactly why uh, it's super weird, uh, super annoying. And it was something I, I just, as soon as I saw it, I wanted to skip over it because I didn't want to confuse people any, even more. But y thank you for throwing that out there. May I ask what was the first language you programmed in? Uh, uh, Python. It was Python. But I was a pretty good bash uh, scripter. And yes, I understand why people say scripting isn't programming, uh, but like I, I learned all the concepts through bash before I hopped into Python basically. Uh, but, but Python's probably the language that, yeah, first programming language. Hope I didn't miss your talk about WSL. We talked about it a little bit, uh, just, just a little bit. We can talk about it some more. Had a programmer in school claimed he started coding with machine code. Uh, yeah, not me, not me at all. Batch like Windows scripting. Uh, so I didn't do any Windows scripting. I was a Linux, I was a Linux guy. Um, I worked as a sysadmin and write scripts. Yes. So if you write scripts for server maintenance, you would be surprised at how when we when we start to learn these things, if you feel good about your knowledge as a as a script as if you feel good about your scripting knowledge, uh, basically almost everything I learned. It was so easily transferable over to Python because I was already doing those things. I was already using variables. I was already using functions. I was already doing if statements. I was already doing all of these things. Ba I was bash scripting, so bash, B-A-S-H. But bash scripting in Windows too. Like scripting is, uh, you know, thinking programmatically about your code. Um, you know, you're being a little bit uh, more explicit, uh, but it works. It works. Bash and command line tools for the win. I agree. I agree. 
this is cool. I, I now like the bar over to the to the right, but I'm gonna move it back to the left just uh, for today. Cool. So the thing below that, you don't need to worry about this now. We will get there and I'll tell you exactly when we'll get there because it's on the schedule. Let's see what week we're gonna get to this. Um, whoa. Is that something we left out? Oh, this is a problem if it is. Let me do it through here. I'll figure out when to add it in. Uh, Cause I know we're talking through, get through some of the other courses. It's something we have to talk about. Um, I'll squeeze it in for sure if we didn't. But this right here is your Git integration, okay? And by Git, I mean G-I-T, okay? Git is probably, uh, for anyone learning software, uh, Git is probably the, it not probably, it is the next most important thing to learn besides the programming language. Yes, learn how to program. Uh, using Git is the next most important thing. Uh, it is a, yes, by default, it's, it's a command line tool, so you don't need to use it in here. Uh, but uh, what it all Git, not all Git, Git is very powerful. What it allows you to do is to be able to work on software projects with people in different places. Multiple people work on the same project uh, and it gives you a bunch of tools and it, it enables a bunch of workflows for you all to be able to successfully work together. It is very, very important. Uh, it, it's a it's a must know. It really is a must know. Um, and we do a whole Git masterclass. So actually, even if we don't include it in this course, even though I'm I'm going to 100% include it in this course, uh, you can also get it. Uh, you'll also be able to get it in a couple weeks on the DevOps an anthology. So uh, it's going to be a little while for this. It's probably going to be about 10 weeks away, but we do a whole Git masterclass here. I will definitely teach you uh, Git. You, I can't let you go through this course without learning Git uh, for sure. All right, so this is the Git integration. This just allows you to easily use Git tools right inside of VS Code. It is a very good tool, uh, very, very impressive. Yes, Git is separate from GitHub. Git is a technology. Uh, GitHub is a platform uh, it's a hosting platform for Git repositories. Uh, so yes, Git is the technology itself. GitHub is a product that kind of utilizes the technology. It's a product around what the technology does. Uh, same thing about GitLab. GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, they're all hosting platforms, but Git is a technology itself. Um, but it's very, very good. If you are someone who uh, doesn't use VS Code, um, but you know all about Git, I would. Seriously, give this tool a chance. It is very helpful. All this, it, it has very good visual indicator cues to let you know what's going on. And it allows you to do, you know, all of your rebasing, everything uh, pretty easily. Um, yeah, it's really, really good. Don't sleep on it, it's, it's great. Uh, right here is the debug tool, run and debug. So this allows you to run your code and to, uh, to it, it provides you tools to be able to figure out where issues are. So a lot of what you're gonna be doing is learning how to write the code, but you're also gonna need to learn how to test your code and learn how to step through the logic. And what a debugging tool allows you to do is step through the logic and it gives you a bunch of tools to be able to stop code when you wanna stop it and pinpoint areas of interest. A lot of developers don't use debuggers. And we're gonna talk about probing statements and a bunch of other things that a lot of developers do, uh, but debuggers can be very, very helpful. So uh, this is a debugger right here. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit, it's gonna be a little while before we learn how to use this. And then right here at the bottom is the extensions tab. This is where you can search for different extensions to easily add to VS Code to make your experience better. There are a bajillion extensions and they are very, very good. Uh, like a lot, there are a lot of very, very good ones. Uh, so we will be using some extensions today. Okay. So that's the activity bar. So explore, that's where you can see your files. When you open up files and folders, this is where you can see them and you can uh, look through all of your files and folders and things. Um, here's where you search and uh, you can search through everything that's open in your explore window. And you can also do some, some fancy searching and you can also replace things as well. Uh, you can, uh, here's your Git integration right here. You don't know what Git is, but we're gonna learn about that later. Uh, here is your debugger. It allows you to find, uh, to, it allows you to 
work through finding errors in your code. The debugger doesn't know where errors in the code are. It doesn't, it's not magic. It is just, it has tools that make it easier for you to locate and point point where bugs are. And extensions is right here at the bottom that allow you to add extensions. Too many extensions, never know which one to take uh, for a given yeah, language or project. That is an issue. That is a problem. Uh, you have too much choice, too many options. Uh, you can, you know, it, there's a lot. There's a lot to parse through for sure. Um, okay. The next thing. After the activity bar, we have the workspaces. This is the main part of the show here. So your workspace, this is your workspace right here. Okay. These are where are we at? There we go. Change the color. This is your workspace. All this right here and your workspace changes sizes. Whoa. I don't know how to use this Wacom pen, but you got it. You got it. Oh, I was pressing the, oh, this, mm, I see what I'm doing now. I'm learning a lot about this Wacom tablet. I like it. This is your whole workspace right here. And what it allows you to do is this is where you're going to open stuff up and do actual work on it. Okay. So I'm going to go back over here to my Explorer. Let's say I wanted to create a new file. I want to call it test.txt. I created a new file. What that did is it actually created a brand new file called test.txt in my documents folder. Check this out. When I go to my documents, look at that. There's a test file right here because I just created it. And, you're, and you can see over here, look at this tab. This tab pops up with the name of the file that you're working on. So you know exactly which file you're working on. I can work on many, many files in here. Maybe I want to go to maybe uh, let's, let's create a couple, a couple more. Aaron.txt. So now test is here and Aaron is here. And again, if we look back into our documents, we'll be able to see that there are, uh, there's another file in here for Aaron now created. But they don't have anything in them yet, but this is our workspace. This is where we're going to work with them. And it has a bunch of tools that's going to allow us to work with them much more easily. Uh, so let's say I type in, uh, hello, this is a test. Remember, this is a text editor. It allows you to do text. So I can type in whatever I want into these files. It's just, it's just a file. Okay. So I type in, hello, this is a test. What's nice about the workspace is it gives you some good visual indicators. Uh, that things are happening or are supposed to happen. So one of them is this right here. Uh, what color are we using? Red. This dot right here. What's nice, this is a great visual indicator. This is something I really like about VS Code. Uh, it has a lot of little things like this. You might not have ever noticed that dot. You may have, you know, you may have been doing stuff and never really noticed that was a thing. It is a great visual indicator that you've made changes to a file and haven't saved them. You will. 100% as a developer, uh, make a bunch of changes, expecting something to happen. You'll try to run your code and you will not have saved your file. I've seen people f fight through issues, change up all their work, but the, the real issue was that they never saved the file that they were in. So it gives you a good visual indicator there. It also gives you a good visual indicator right here in the activity bar. Okay. It gives you a good visual indicator right there. See that one, it says you have one file that you have modified, but not saved 100% squared mo auto save. There is an auto save feature. Uh, I am not a fan of auto save personally. You should be a fan of auto save though. You sh everyone else should be a fan of auto save. I am not a fan of auto save. Um, I've had, uh, I mean, the whole reason, the reason I'm not a fan of auto save is because I was once working in a project with hot reloading. Uh, that had a number of the, the parts of it that I was working on, uh, had a bunch of pieces that didn't hot reload correctly. And I, for those changes to take effect, I had to, uh, I had to close, I had to stop the, the process and restart it. Uh, and then it was doing some stuff with the database. And the problem was when it was, it would auto save before I was ready and it would start doing some weird jobs that I didn't need to be done quite yet. Uh, and so it, it turned me off to the whole autosave process and I've left it off ever since you should turn on autosaving. You should. 
I usually keep autosave off so it doesn't clutter up my timeline. Yeah, you know that 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 works as well. Um, but yeah, I leave I leave autosave off. But autosave will help you. But there are two really good visual indicators, so you can tell if you have a file saved or not. And watch this: as soon as I save it, oh, actually, I can't use that. I have to do this. As soon as I save it. As soon as I save it, there we go. I hit Control S, so that's a that's a shortcut. Control S to save, just like Microsoft Word. Uh, you can see now that I saved the file, there's no more dot. It's now the X to close this, and there's no more one over here. Really, really helpful. Little things. It's a little thing. Uh, it's very, very helpful. So I have a file here, um, and let's say I edit this one. And I put some text in there. It says, hi, my name is Aaron um, in this file and I save it. What's nice about the workspace is I have things where I can split the windows here so I can uh, put Aaron.txt over here and I can put test.txt over here, which is really nice. I did that by hitting this little uh, split editor icon right here, which is helpful. So I can split it up and I can open up something new. I go back over here and double click Aaron.txt and it'll open up over here. And so I can have two files side by side and I can compare them and I can be modifying two files at once. I can actually split it more than that. I can keep splitting. So that's something super duper helpful. Uh, you can also do some uh, some horizontal uh, stuff as well, uh, which is super nice. And there are some other, uh, some toggles here, but the main part about the workspace that I want you to know is that you can open up multiple files and it'll open up, open them up via tabs. And if you want, you can start to split them up to be able to visually view multiple things more helpfully. Yes, it's a T Mux pain. That's exactly what it is. It's a T pain Mux. That's a, it. Yep. Yeah, if you're not familiar with T Mux, that is a terminal uh, kind of a window splitting application that makes it easier for you to do uh, things just like this. But yeah, the workspace, whenever you open up a file, uh, it's gonna open up in this workspace right here and you can mod this is where you're gonna be modifying it and doing your actual work uh, right there. The status bar at the bottom. The status bar is, let me, can I scoot this up? I cannot. Uh, the status bar is this blue bar at the bottom. Now I don't really have anything open. So let me see, let me, let me open something up all the way uh, right now, because I don't really have anything going. Uh, the status bar is not really telling me a ton. Um, it's telling me basically there's no problems. There's no warnings. There's no issues right now. Um, but usually, you know, if there are, uh, there's some, there's some information down here about problems that are going on. Uh, and you might see some stuff here as well. If, the, if there are issues, uh, but right here, it's giving me some information about uh, different things. It's saying, Hey, my current cursor is giving me my cursor location. It's saying your cursor is at line one, column twenty. So I'm twenty. I'm twenty columns over. So if I take my, if I take this back, look how it's, look how that number is going down. It's telling me exactly where my cursor is. This can be pretty helpful if you uh, if you have an application with a bunch of lines. So let's uh, copy b b b b ah darn it z z z z. Let me copy a new line. Uh, hold on. Let's do this this let's copy both of these actually V copy from here up copy. Yeah, there we go. All right. So now I got a bunch if, let's say I put my arrow with my cursor here. Maybe I can't see it. Maybe my color scheme. I can't really see it. It tells me exactly where it, where it is line eight column 10. So I know it's at the very least it's helpful because I know my cursor is what line my cursor is on. So that's super duper nice. So it shows line numbers over here. So it makes it easy to find different things right here. It shows me uh, what indentation is. So if I hit a tab, it will take four spaces. Okay. So um, one, two, three, four. So it goes over four spaces and that's something you can change in the programming world. There are, uh, it actually might be something you get asked in an interview. Usually it's asked in a joking manner and usually like it is a, a, just a matter of preference. Uh, but people will ask tabs or spaces, uh, tabs are actually a different character from a space character. And so, you know, it, uh, it, that, that does have a, it does have a tremendous effect on, uh, on your, 
your I don't want to say I don't want to say it has a tremendous effect on your code, but uh, understanding understanding that tabs and spaces are different and that when you do a tab, uh, if it actually inserts a tab character, that might cause different issues than if you actually uh, insert some spaces instead. Uh, so I've run into tons of problems, uh, especially with, uh, I, I'm a DevOps guy, I do a lot of YAML and YAML is a uh, space, is it's, it's white space sensitive, uh, same thing with Python. And I've had some issues where I didn't, things appeared to be working fine because visually it looked good, but a tab, something had a tab, something had a space, you know, and there were, there were some mismatches in the way things were set up. Uh, it can be a problem. It can definitely be a problem. So this tells us what we, this tells us what we want to do for indentation. So I can say, Hey, actually I would like you to indent using tabs. Uh, and so you can easily change that here and it sets it up globally for your editor, which is nice. Then it has some encoding. Uh, we talked a little bit about ASCII last time, but encoding is, uh, is, you know, how we interpret, uh, you know, these ones and zeros. How, how do we, how do we represent a, and the letter a an English letter a, how do we represent these different things? How do we represent emojis? Uh, UTF eight is kind of the, the main American ASCII stuff. You can actually change the encoding to other things. If you want, you can, uh, yeah, you can actually switch up the encoding for the application. Let's say you are from another, uh, country. Maybe you have, maybe you need Korean characters. Uh, you can change encoding to allow things like that to work as well. Um, language mode, this is plain text. So if I were to, uh, I can change this to right now, it's saying this is plain text because a dot TXT file is the extension for a plain text file. And so that's what it has here. VS code has an auto detection feature. Well, it'll auto, it'll automatically detect the type of language or the type of file that you're using. If, if let's say I was modifying this, but I wanted to see it in a different way. I wanted it to like, yes, it's a text file, but I, you know, I wanted it to, uh, I'm writing Python code in there for some reason. I don't know why you wouldn't just make it a Python file, but I can like uh, change the way that the, I can change the way that VS code is interpreting this file. So when I change it to Python, uh, look at it, you know, it, it, it changes some colors and things. It, it changes how this file is being looked at. And so VS code has a lot of tools built in. It's got something called IntelliSense. Uh, it's got, it's got, a, it's got some syntax highlighting, all kinds of stuff that makes it easier for you to work with different applications. And so you can apply, uh, the type of language that you need to a file. You can change it. I'll, I'll go to auto detect. It'll go back to plain text here. Then this thing right here is tweet feedback. Uh, if you really want to give them feedback, you can tweet about it. And right here is for notifications if there are any notifications. So that is the status bar. Um, the more and more stuff you add and do, uh, the more stuff that will pop up down here. Yes, please just use UTF-8, I agree. Um, all right, so that is the status bar. Let's quickly get through the last two pieces so we can run a little bit of code. The terminal. What's nice about VS code, but once we learn a, a little bit about command line next week, or yeah, next week, we can stay, VS code is so nice because it has a built-in terminal uh, and it allows us to stay in here for everything that we need to do. There are a couple different ways of opening up the terminal. One, click the terminal thing here and click new terminal. So terminal up top, new terminal, and take a look at that. If you're on uh, if you're on Mac, this will open up Mac or, or Linux. This will open up your normal terminal. If you're on Windows, it'll open up whatever's your default. So right now, this opened up PowerShell for me. So this is just a PowerShell terminal, and you have the option if you have WSL installed or if you want to use Command Prompt, you click this little down arrow right here, and you can change which one you're using. So I can click Command Prompt, and it'll open up a Command Prompt window for me. I can click the down arrow. I can click Ubuntu, so WSL two, and it'll open up the Ubuntu terminal for me. So you have some options here again, if you're on windows, uh, but the terminal is very nice. It opens up. This is a full fledged terminal, just like whatever program you're using before. And you can do everything right here from in this window. What's nice about this. It also has a problems window. So if you have issues with your code, uh, it, it'll display the problems here, uh, which is helpful. It'll have an output pane. Uh, so you can see some output, particularly if you're doing JavaScript, um, and then a debug console, if you're trying to debug, it has a bunch of cool stuff right here, but the terminal is probably the most important piece. You can also open this up by, uh, I think, Control J, maybe Command J as well on Mac. So that's usually what I do is Command J. And then what did it say? Command Shift 
control shift uh, back tick or tilt. What is it? That's back tick. Uh, we'll also do it. Uh, I think also, I think control back tick will do it as well. Just control back tick, I think will do it as well. Or control tilde. So tilde is usually right under the escape key. Yeah. But uh, yeah, control J. Oof. I almost spilled all of my water everywhere. I spilled some of it. But that's the way you can easily get access to it. So that's something that I do like. The shortcuts in VS Code are super duper helpful. I provided a video in the material for this week uh, that can help you learn some of these shortcuts if you need to use them. Uh, the more and more you learn, the faster you'll be. Uh, but it's nice to know some shortcuts like opening and closing the terminal um, right there. So yes, terminal is there. If I do this, if I do uh, Control J and type in Go version, you can see I have Go installed here. Before class ends, should students download Git? Uh, you don't need Git yet. Not yet. Nope, you don't need it yet. Uh, probably in the next two weeks, we'll probably download it and get it uh, set up. Um, all right, so that's the terminal. And then running our first Go program. So. Real quick, we're just going to run our first Go program. Uh, we don't need to do it in, we're gonna do it here. We're gonna do it here inside of the Go Playground first, and then we'll actually make it inside of VS Code really quick. So the Go Playground, like I said, is just a Go environment for you to use if you'd like to run a little bit of Go code. This Go Playground is helpful because remember, we talked about Go being a compiled language, uh, sometimes this is the best place to go to see a little bit of code run to figure out uh, exactly what needs to happen and what's gonna what's gonna be going on. So uh, right here, if you go to again go.dev slash play, it'll take you to this. Anyone can use it. Uh, and here is a generic Go program. Here's the basic Hello World program. The first program everyone learns how to run is a Hello World program. What Hello World is, it is, a, it is a program that's going to output the text Hello World to the console or to the user in a specific, uh, you know, it, it, it's gonna display it to the user, uh, usually in the console. So this is what that program looks like, okay? Uh, and so here's what we're gonna do. Here's what I would like you to do. You can stay there if you want. If you're feeling, if you're feeling froggy real quick, I would like you to copy uh, all you can copy all of it. You can copy everything that's in here if you want, and we're gonna talk through it. I'm gonna copy it, and I'm gonna do this because I want to get a little bit of uh, of color coding in this to make it stand out to you a little bit more. So I'm gonna head over to VS Code. Okay. So inside of VS Code, the way that you create a new file, the easiest way to create a new file is if you put your mouse if you're in the Explorer tab. So click on the Explorer tab. If you click this little button right here. It's a little new file icon right here, or you can go to file, new file, either one. Okay, so I'm gonna click this little tab here and I'm gonna type in hello.go. You can call this file whatever you want, but the extension for a go file is .go. If you see .go, it is a go file. It needs to be a .go for it to be read. So .go is all you need. So you can call it whatever you want, .go. So I hit this. I clicked, uh, I gave it a name, so I called it hello.go. And you can see here, VS Code automatically recognized this as a Go file. What it also did is down here, it says, hey, would you like to install the recommended extensions for Go? This is gen generally relatively safe to do. It's, it's pretty safe to do. This is a VS Code saying, hey, we have a number of items that we think is gonna make your experience better with this language. I think it's a safe place to start. You can absolutely go ahead and click install. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take you to the extensions page and it's automatically going to install it for you. The way that you know that it's installed is right here. It'll say installed, okay? And then um, for Go, there are a number of other tools uh, once you install this thing that are going to uh, request to be installed. They're not necessary, but they will help. So what I want you to do is click this install all right here. This actually takes a little bit of time. So if you have a slow internet connection, uh, maybe wait on this uh, because it might affect your ability to see the stream, but uh, you can always just close the, you can always just close 
this window to stop it, but I'm gonna go ahead and click install all, and I'm gonna let this go do its thing. It's gonna take a little bit, uh, but it's gonna go through and it's gonna do it. But see up here back in the workspace, this hello.go is still over here, okay? And it's still gonna give me this information because the stuff's still installing, but I'm just gonna X out of it and you can see it's still installing stuff. You can minimize this or you can X out of this output window by hitting the X. It does not stop what's going on. If I hit control J, it opens right back up. So I'm gonna hit this little X right here just to get the window out of my face. And I'm gonna paste into this file. I must have skipped a step, failed to locate go binary, okay? Um, this, that might be a different problem. Uh, I actually, if you, if you go to the terminal and you can still type in go version, you might be okay, but we can work through that in a second. Let's, uh, let's, let's finish this up and then I'll help you resolve some of those issues. All right. So I'm going to paste that code. So I, I copied the code from here. If you're having issues, just go, just go here, go to go.dev slash play, and you can stay right on the screen. Okay. Everything I'm doing, you can do. Um, and I'll actually do it in here as well. But I'm gonna, I'm, I wanted to paste it here into VS Code so you could see uh, kind of how a text editor helps you. It starts to color code things. Right now you don't know what any of this means, but it begins to color code it uh, and, and help you uh, visually see things um, that you can do. Uh, and it, you'd be surprised at how helpful this is. So first thing we're gonna do is go back over to the Go Playground and we're gonna run some code. This, this is a fully functioning Go application, and I'm gonna type in run. What it's gonna do is it's gonna go off, it's gonna compile, and then it's gonna run down here. Your output is gonna be at the bottom of this page. So the output is hello, and then I'm assuming this is a Japanese character for hello. I believe it's Japanese, I don't know for sure. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's Japanese. And then it says program exited. So it did what the program told it to do, and then it exited. Remember we said, Programming is just giving the computer instructions. These instructions say, print this out to the screen and then you're done. Okay, let's talk about the anatomy of this, of this Go program, okay? Here, and actually let's do it over here again where we have a little bit of color. Here is what's necessary for a Go program to run. We are gonna cover this again. This is just a little intro to it. The, here's what's necessary. All that's necessary for a Go application to run is you must have this, okay? You must have a main package, okay? And so I actually, uh, well, package main, you must have a package here. Um, and package main is gonna be the, the main, that's gonna be the ones you need to run. We'll talk about package main later. There, uh, there is a video, uh, and there's an article on the main package in the material. Again, it's okay, we haven't gone over it yet. Read it, watch it, see what you get out of it, and we'll close the gap on the knowledge uh, as we get a little bit uh, farther. Oh, in Japanese, the word would be world, yeah. Okay, then we have this line five here. We'll talk about this in a second, but we do not actually need this line. Line five is actually not necessary, okay? So I'm gonna cross it out. You don't need this. You need it to run the code that we have now, but for a Go for a Go program to run, you do not need that. And then this is the other thing you need. This funk main. It doesn't matter what's in here. It doesn't matter what this line is, but what you need is a funk main with these uh, parentheses, and you need an open curly brace, and you need a closed curly brace. So those are the two things you need. You need package main, and you need this funk main main. I know that can be a little confusing. You don't know what it is and it seems like a lot. These are the two necessary things to run a go uh, program. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to go over this hello world program and then I'll show you a hello world in Python and you'll say, oh wow. Now I see why people learn Python first. Um, but yeah, th those are the two things that are necessary. You need a main function. You need a main package. Okay. It's also recommended to update the go tool set each time you update go. Control Shift P. Ah, yeah, you know that. You're gonna have to. Be, you're gonna. I'm gonna have to commission you to put some guides together for me. That would be great. Hundred percent. Okay, so those are the things that are absolutely necessary for this program to run. This program is a Hello World program, and so all, as you can see here, 
Uh, it's got it. It's got this FMT dot print line, and it's got hello and this uh, kanji symbol. Let me know if I I'm not using kanji correctly. <laughs> uh, but this is a this is a tool that you're gonna use. This is a function that you're gonna use to be able to print stuff to the screen. Uh, this is the this is a package in Go. So we're gonna talk about Go packages. Um, you don't need to know it yet, but because we're using this package, we have to import it. And so we're using we're using a package, and then we're using this tool called print line that's inside of the package. So we we basically imported this package, fumped, and we're using the print line tool inside of that package, and we're we're using it to print out hello and this kanji symbol. So if you want to mess around with it. Right now, it prints out hello and the kanji symbol. If you want to change it, if you want to play around with it, you can do this. You can, you know, this is just text here. I'm going to leave that symbol because I don't know how to get it back. I can refresh the page, but I'm going to say hello, everyone. I typed in more text in there and let's see what happens when I run it again. I'm going to type run and I'm going to go down and look now it prints out hello, everyone and the symbol. And so basically everything that's inside of these Double quotes is what's going to print out. Okay. If I do something wrong, if I do something like put something outside of the double quotes, this is actually an error. This actually, you know, the program doesn't know what to do with this. If I run it, I actually get a problem. Okay. So if you do something that doesn't work, it will, it'll give you a problem. And it tells me, Hey, I, I you know, I expected a comma or a closing parenthesis, uh, telling me that there was an error with what I did. So it's completely okay. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It will give you an error if you do. It uh, doesn't mean you're going to know how to parse that error, but whatever's inside of these quotes is what will print out. So if I do all this and I run it, that's what will get printed out right here. Excellent. That makes it easy. The Go Playground makes it easy because we put the code in and we hit the run uh, button. Now, how do we do it on our own? How do we do it on a computer uh, when we're ready to do it ourselves? The way that you run this code from your computer. The way that you run it is if you install everything properly, um, which I think everything's installed properly now. Sometimes, sometimes it'll give you a uh, a run command where you can easily uh, run the program and not have to worry about command line stuff. You should worry about command line stuff, but uh, I'm I'm just letting you know what your options are. So you could actually add a configuration and tell your computer where Go is, and then it would actually give you a little button over here to just click to click run, and you could run your code. That's great. It works. I don't recommend that. You need to learn how to execute this from the command line. Um, the way that we execute this from the command line is I'm going to open up a terminal. And from here, um, I actually have uh, this hello.go right here. You, don't worry about this LS command. Don't worry about anything. It, it might actually not open this up where you need it to open up. Just know that where I currently am on the computer from the command line, this hello.go program is right there. If I want to run this program, the way that you run a go program is go space run space the name of the file that you want to run. So go run hello.go is how I'm going to run this file. And so I'm going to run it. And take a look at that. It printed out hello with this. Now it took, it took a little bit of time. I don't know if you saw a little bit of delay there. If I run it again, it'll be much faster. So remember how we said, you said why uh, why is yours in WSL? Oh, it's because I I opened up a WSL. It opens up in PowerShell by default, I believe. Yeah, and so I can do the same thing here. I could go go run uh, hello dot go, and it'll print it out. Hmm, it's slow every time in PowerShell. Uh, not really slow. But go run the name of the file. That's what it is. Go run the name of the file. That's how we are going to run a program. Now, remember we said that Go is a compiled language and usually you have to compile the program first. Well, Go is nice and has provided a tool. When you type in Go run, it basically does compile the program uh, and then immediately runs it, which is you know pretty helpful, super nice, um, and it does it does it in a way where it doesn't have to compile it to a full uh, binary at the end. We could uh, to show you how a compiled program runs. Check this out. If I do go uh, build 
uh, hello.go. It just built this into an executable that I could use. It compiled it into a full on program for me to use. So now check this out. If I go into my computer and go to documents and it made this application here, if I, if I double click it. I assumed it would open up in something and say, hello world. Uh, but I can run it from the command line here. And because it's just an, a, an executable, I don't actually have to do. Oops, hold on. Uh, I don't have to do anything. I can do hello.exe. Exe is the program. And look at that. Every time I run it, look how fast it just kicks out here. Mine is saying it can't find this, the file specified. So that is likely because where it is, wherever you save the file to, one, make sure you save the file. Two, wherever the file is saved, it might not be in the directory that your terminal opens up again, opens up in. We will talk about how to find those things next class. It gets real complicated from here. I would just run it inside of uh, Go Playground for now. Um, but yeah. So to make Go apps uh, to EXE, yes. So, so an EXE is the is the file format for an executable on Windows. So when we compile, we actually compile to something called a target. Okay. So on uh, when I'm compiling for Windows, because I install Go on Windows, it's automatically set up to compile for Windows. And when I run Go build, it builds it into a Windows application, which is a .exe. If I go over here, uh, so I built it there, watch this. If I build it now in the WSL, if I do Go build, uh, hello.go, whoops. What this does is this actually compiled it into this, uh, into a binary file, which is actually a different type of file. So, so if I try to run hello.exe in, in uh, Linux, it won't work. Oh, it does work. I didn't think it would work, but I can also just run this hello file. This is the one that's compiled for Linux. I actually didn't know that would work. Oh, but you know what? That might be a WSL feature. It might not work in native Linux. Uh, it might have, it might have, because you have some uh, overlap there, because you have some, uh, what's it called? They work together. They work together. Um, I guess that's why it worked, uh, but I, I feel like it shouldn't have worked. My antivirus is tripping. It keeps quarantining my hello.go. That can happen. It depends on where you put it. So maybe you find a new place to go save your file. How do you change your terminal from bash to PowerShell? So the way that I, the way that I do it, uh, the way that I did it is if you have bash installed, uh, check out this, there's a drop down here and it'll give you PowerShell command prompt. If you have WSL installed, it gives you WSL by default though. It'll probably just give you these two and maybe this JavaScript debug terminal. Um, but yeah, because I have WSL, I click WSL. If I want to be in WSL, if I want to be in PowerShell. I'm here. And then because I have multiple ones opened, I can just click on the one that I have opened to mess with it here. I wonder if we can make GUIs in Go. This will be great in Docker. Um, I actually don't, I mean, I feel like you can. I've never done it. I've never seen anyone do it, but um, like you can. Legit had to disable my antivirus in general because they refused to compile my Java files. Very interesting. I'm running Arch Linux. Thank you so much, Darren. Uh, that's dope. <laughs> that's dope. It's working now. I had to run it twice. All good. Okay. So, um, so that's what compiling does. It actually turns it into a little program that we can execute, which is kind of nice. Um, but to run it, to run a go file, you just run go run in the name of the file. That's what I want you to take away today. I, that's it. The way that we run a go file is to run go run in the name of the file. And so it allows us to not have to compile it into a final binary. It allows us to kind of see what's going on. Uh, so it kind of gives us some of the benefits of an interpreted language uh, in that aspect, which is pretty nice. So go run in the name of the file that we want to run. Very nice. That's the same thing as just doing something in here and clicking run. All right, so that's the anatomy. So you need the package, you need, you need the funk main and that's all you need to actually make a, a, a working application. Like I actually think if I delete this and I delete this, I think this is still a valid go application. I'm going to run it. Exactly. It doesn't do anything, but it is a valid application. If I change something, if I change it to like main two, it 
instead of just main. Let's see what happens. Now it actually get a, an error. It says, hey, function main is undeclared in the main package and saying, hey, I'm expecting to see a main package. I don't see one. So this is all that's necessary. This is the bare, this is the bare bones functioning uh, Go program. This is, uh, this is all you need. This is what you need to run. And then it'll, it'll basically run anything that you have inside of here, any kind of code you have inside of here, it will run. And remember the way that we did that is format, fumped, dot print line and some quotes and we did hello world and it's this is what i would need now there's something missing which is that uh that that import line because we're using this font package see how it underlines this this is what a text editor does for you it says hey I don't know what that is. You, I, this is not something you can use. I don't know. I have no idea what Fumt is. And remember, that's because we didn't import it before we had it imported. But check this out. Because we have our tools installed, I think if I save the file, look at that. It automatically imports it for me because of the extensions that we installed with Go. I click Control S. I try to use something. I hit Control S. It imports it for me. And now this is a functioning uh, Hello World application. So what I want you to do is I want you to mess around in the Go Playground. I would like you to also see if you can make uh, something run here. Um, there are a couple of tutorials and things. I think I might've included one in the, uh, in the extra material. Again, there, there's a lot that there's, there's a lot that the, com the command line has a lot to do with this. So right now you may be trying to do it and you may be getting any any number of errors. There's so many different errors you could be getting right now, uh, because the way that we're interacting with this, uh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that matter from the command line that we may not be taking into an account right now, um, and so that that'll make much more sense next week. But I want you to just play with it. I want you to 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 Google around with it. I want you to to mess around and see what happens when you change certain things. See what kind of error you get when you do something like you know we put some stuff here, but what would happen if we did something you know. Uh, can I put anything inside of here or what happens if I change what happens if I do two of these? What happens if I take this and I do one underneath it? Can I do that? Is that a valid thing? I want you to explore it. Okay. And I'm gonna save it. Uh, see, I'm used to, I'm used to Vim. So I keep hitting I, the reason that keeps popping up is because I keep doing control W to save it because I'm, I almost did it again. There we go. And let's run it now. What happens when we run two of them? Well, look at that. It prints out twice. Remember, all we're doing is giving the computer commands to do. Computer's dumb is doing it for us. Uh, uh, booger, a boogreed, boogerito. Uh, if, if that's to me, no, we're not just starting. We are. Uh, we're actually coming to an end uh, very soon. We're just starting the whole course, though. The course is just beginning. Uh, this is the second week of the course. There are twenty more weeks after this. So that is how you run it. Any questions about how you get it to run or if anyone's experiencing any problems and wants to make it run, I may be able to walk you to uh, walk you through the answer to what that is on how to make that work. I know you say it run from the terminal, but when I run from VS code GUI, I hit run without debugging and now it's saying build error, go build, go mod not found. Ooh, how do I create that? Okay. So one, how did you get the, how did you get that option? You, you went to run and it allowed you to run a run without debugging. And I'm gonna allow access. Okay. So I'm probably getting the same area you're getting right now. For me, it says the system cannot find file specified. All right. So uh, I actually don't use that pretty often, but uh, the run allows you to actually run the code. Uh, but the problem is uh, there's a couple problems. One, it's actually trying to uh, discover where some stuff is. Build error, go build, debug bin, go.mod file not found in current directory or any parent directory. So this has to do with the way modules work in Go, uh, sp specifically uh, the newer way uh, this works. Um, but I'm interested to know why. So. You may have to just create a go.mod file in here. No, no, it didn't break anything. Definitely didn't break anything. Uh, you might just need to 
what will make this happy? I think if I just create a go.mod in the same directory that this is in, I think I can leave it empty. I think I can actually leave it empty and run without debugging. That's fine. Terminal, no, run, run without debugging. Uh, nothing declared. So, so we got to set up, we, you know, go a mod edit, um, except my, so we have to set up a basic go mod file. This is annoying. Um, it is annoying that it's, that it's forcing you to use this. Um, it's, it's not, it's not hard to fix. It's just, I'm actually, I'm actually very surprised. So the reason it's doing this is because of however this is set up, whatever command is set up and we can actually see it here. Uh, starting uh, dlv.exe dap check go version um, go version false listen blah blah, blah. so the command that, it, that this is going through uh, it's expecting us to have go mods here yes I'm pretty sure go mod in it will fix it uh, I was trying to see if there's an easy way to do it without I feel like if we if we start down the go mod in it route uh, it's going to make us uh, I feel we got to talk about go go modules and I really want to hold off on go modules until like week like eight. Um, but yes, I think go mod in it will fix it. Um, let, let's do it. Let's let's just do it. So I debug console to terminal. Um, and actually, um, yeah, example initialize um, outside of go pass. So this also has to do with we didn't go through uh, a standardized workspace for go. Um, which is fine. Go out, go, go modules actually allow you to work outside of that uh, balance right now. I don't want to dive into this. It, it is still a relatively easy fix. I don't want to dive into that um, yet. I think it'll make things more confusing for people. Uh, for now, I would run it from the terminal uh, or I think you can uh, also, oh no, no it, it didn't touch, I guess those are the types of questions you should ask. Uh, and what you stumbled upon is actually a really good, uh, Man, it's 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 a it's a it's not a pro, it's not a problem at all. Uh, it's just that I think that because we also not only do we not know enough about Go yet to talk about Go modules, we also don't know enough about the command line. Uh, I think we should wait until at least next week. But what I do want you to do, if you come back next week, I'm gonna set a little reminder for myself. I want you to ask again next week after we've done a little bit of command line stuff. Um, I think I think I'll be able to explain the way that modules. Uh, the structure and things a little bit better once you understand, once everyone understands the file system and the way folders and things work, um, I think uh, I think that'll be better. Um, I think that'll help. Um, but I could I could I could throw something in here, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off, and I don't want people to be confused. But yeah, see if you can, see if you can get it running. Um, also, feel free to like. Google like, yo, how do I run go code and, and go through a tutorial or something. Um, again, just to, just to like practice some other things to read about some other things to go to, to, you know, seat time is the most effective thing here and you'll get a lot of it. I know we haven't started coding yet. And again, that's because some of the stuff is hard. Like just, just getting set up and ready to go is difficult. What I want you to do by next week, all you need to have ready by next week is the ability to run go version and have it give you a go version, okay? So if you haven't gotten that far yet, make sure you reach out in Discord to somebody, to everybody, to me, uh, get help, ask for help. Uh, you know, we can do some screen sharing sessions, whatever. Uh, make sure you can get to the point where you can run some code locally on a computer. You can do it as long as you have go version installed. I mean, as long as you type in go version and you get something back, you're good to go there. And if you have, v I want you to get VS code installed. Those are the two things that we that I want to make sure happen by next week. Uh, I need you to have both of those things because uh, we're, we're still not coding this week because we're learning command line stuff. Um, but I think once we hit the command line stuff, I think that's the part where you'll start you'll start to feel good about yourself, but you'll also start to feel like we're actually doing things that might be difficult. And you there will be points next week where you are confused. Um, and so I don't want you to get I don't want things to compound and for you to get stuck uh, behind those things. Try to get Go installed. Try to get VS Code installed. I uh, try to learn a little bit about it. Some of the things that I included in the classroom. Uh, 
Uh, some of the things I included in the classroom are uh, are specifically about both of those things. Let's see. Uh, so this is cool. The interpretive versus compiled. There are four videos in here, and I, I was I let you know what to do with each one of these. Um, uh, it displays them in a different way. Um, but these are pretty interesting. You don't need to watch all of these. You only need to watch the first two really, which is these two up here. Um, these are a little bit more advanced, but again, a little bit more helpful to help you dive a little bit deeper, to help you start asking some questions, uh, to, to create some confusion for you. The creation of confusion is going to be necessary throughout your process as well. So that you can go look for answers so that you can stumble upon things, you know, that, Learning here isn't linear, like the, like tech learning. There's some stuff that's linear. You're gonna learn, you know, we're gonna take a path to learn some things, but the way that you learn all this stuff, the way that you get all this stuff inside of your head, uh, it, it almost can't be linear. You can't just keep building off of things. Uh, some stuff you'll hear over here, you'll hear, at the beginning of your at the beginning of your journey you'll pick up this little thing you pick up this little thing and you'll hear all these different things you won't really understand what they are and then you know two weeks down the line someone will say something or we'll do something and it'll take the little bit of knowledge you grabbed out here and it'll pull it into your core core levels of knowledge and you'll now know what this thing really is and then you'll be like oh wow i just read a whole article about this whole topic uh, but i didn't really understand it but we just did this one thing and now i understand it and it'll pull that stuff in so it doesn't need to be linear uh, you can you can start to pick up other things outside of the things that we're uh, specifically focusing on. So there's some stuff there for that. Um, there's some stuff about the main functions that you can read about that's going to help a little bit. And like I said, I called it out right here. You are going to be confused. Um, but yeah, and then there's some stuff about VS Code to learn a little bit, a little bit more about VS Code. Uh, it's requiring request access. Hold on, let's take a look right now. That's a good question forms google forms let's get that knocked out now um try forms get started no no i already have hold on docs here we go it's asking let's go settings uh let's see Defaults, assign points, miss questions, uh, preview, customize theme, collaborators. Respond, maybe responses, no. Let me see here. Collect email addresses. I'll turn that off. Allow response editing. Um, I don't care. I, so I don't. So these quizzes are for you, um, and it, it'll be a general guide because I'll start to see what people are getting on them, uh, like as a, as a collective. Um, and if there's anything we need to recover, we can. I limit to one response. You can take it as many times as you want. Restrict to. There we go. Require sign in. I don't need your email address. All right, try it. Can you try it again now? Uh, YGBSM. I don't think I need to like click save. Do I? There's no save. Yeah, I think that's good. Let me know if you're able to get into there or not. Maybe I'll try from a uh, incognito window. Um, where's the link for this? It works perfect. Thanks for bringing that up. N Smith, welcome to the channel. I'm glad you were able to find me on this day. Uh, yeah, everyone who did find us today in our new, uh, we are doing uh, two 22 week boot camps plus another thing called uh, an anthology series. So Camp Code is on Mondays. Camp Cloud, uh, if you want to learn anything about cloud computing with AWS. Uh, come through on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, we're doing a DevOps anthology. So the first seven weeks we're learning Linux, then we'll dive into the systems administration stuff. Then we'll dive into some Git stuff and then containers and then, you know, Kubernetes and CI, CD, all those things we'll be learning. Um, you know, it, that'll be longer than 22 weeks. Uh, that series is going to be a, a pretty significant amount longer than 22 weeks, but that course is made up of a bunch of smaller courses. So again, 
first part is Linux. So if you want to learn Linux, come through for just seven weeks and you're good to go there. Uh, then each piece is, you know, between they're between like two weeks and eight weeks, uh, each of the different pieces. But yeah, yeah, Docker and Kubernetes. So Docker and Kubernetes are the two things that we get asked about the, like by far the most often. So after we run this DevOps series, we're probably going to run Docker, Docker and Kubernetes course, uh, like very, like very often, like, like we'll probably run one. We'll probably run each of them like every like month and a half, two months, just because people are always asking for it. Um, yeah, probably running like every month and a half or two months. Uh, and we might even do, I mean, we're probably going to, I'm going to try to pre-record one as well. So if you want to just watch a pre-recorded one, uh, feel free to do that as well. And then you can come through to the, uh, to the stream for some of the live, uh, we're gonna do some problem. We, like each of the things we're gonna be doing genuine problems. Uh, so right again, right now we haven't gotten far enough to like really start doing stuff yet. When we do, we'll actually be doing real problems during each class. And so we'll, we'll contextualize it a little bit more um, to kind of help you out. But yeah, that's it for today. I'm trying to think. Yeah, hop into the Google Classroom. There's some stuff in there for, to help you out. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that we've learned over the past two weeks, ask away. If you have questions about anything, career questions, whatever, feel free to throw them out there to ask. I'm doing my best to get to as much as I can. Um, so, so if you haven't gotten a response from me, uh, you should be getting one pretty soon, running through them as quickly as I can. But again, don't be afraid to ask your fellow classmates inside of Discord. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I, I generally learn a lot from you guys during the stream. Learned a lot today. Thank you guys uh, so much for helping me out with some of those things. Uh, YGBSM, you get a, uh, you get a gold star for showing me the moving the panel to the right side. That's a big deal. I will never, ever forget that. Uh, this is, that's super duper nice. That's makes so much sense for me. Amazing Raven. Thanks so much for coming through. Absolutely. Um, do I do any mentoring? So I, so I do, um, I don't have a ton of time, um, anymore, uh, but reach out to me. Um, I can definitely, uh, I can answer, I can, an I can do some asynchronous mentoring, uh, answer some questions about if you have any, if you have specific questions and stuff, but I can point you to mentors. I can point you to mentors, to people who are willing to mentor. I can introduce you to people. So reach out if you need that. Um, and as I get more time, uh, I'm working on building capacity, building, you know, I'm building capacity in my life, but, you know, it just, you know, now with a baby and a new house and everything, I'm just like, I always have something to do with work and business, all that other stuff. Um, when I get a little bit more time, I will 100% go back to mentoring, uh, because it's what I love to do. Again, I told you all my only goal is to hope, hopefully help everybody get the same opportunities that I've had in tech, which have been amazing. Um, I can't wait to see you all at the top of the tech mountain, uh, living, living the good life. Yes. You know, it's not, it's not all gravy, uh, but you know, it's a lot better than the lives. Most of us lived before tech. I don't know many people who had a better life before tech, uh, than after tech. Uh, so, you know, keep going proud of you all come through tomorrow for, uh, come through tomorrow for uh, camp cloud new baby. She's a little over a year now. Uh, and she's actually getting really, uh, easy to, to me really easy to take care of. You know, I, I'm, I was real confused during the infant stage, but now that she's like up and about and can do things for herself and then she's pretty independent and running around and playing. I like that. I can do that. It's exhausting, but I like it. It's a, it's a good, you know, it's a good time. Even though I'm a software engineer, you often lead me to learn more. Dope. Dope. I mean, Hey, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I like every day I'm tempted to like get a job being a software engineer. Cause I would love to, because, I, because I spent my whole career, like sysadmin, DevOps, site reliability, engineering stuff, like cloud stuff. Like I would love to spend, I, I, I did lead a software team for a little while. Uh, but I, I would, I would love to spend time as a pure dedicated software engineer. What's harder cloud or coding. I think coding is much harder personally. Uh, again, because it, it asks you the type of person you are, I think it's, easier to learn the amount of concepts that coding has like coding has a finite amount of concepts for the most part like that that you need um and i think it's easier to learn all those concepts but it's harder to put them into practice and i think that, that cloud stuff has a lot more uh specific concepts to learn but it's much easier to put them in a, into into context it's much easier to put them into practice like it's it's, it's much more straightforward to use the things that you want to use um and so yeah i think cloud is uh 
easier than coding for most people. Not for, you know, not everyone. Some people feel differently, uh, but you know, that's my experience. Strager, thank you so much for the <laughs> for the raid. We are we're finishing up, but let me give you a shout out. Thank you so much. Community here is amazing. Strager is also a super dope uh, programming um, streamer here. You can learn a ton. Like these these people are smart. Like I'm your average engineer. I've done a lot of stuff, so I know a lot. I know a lot. You know I'm. I'm big on the, 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 the top of the T-shaped development thing. Uh, you know, I've got a couple places where I go pretty deep. These people are very, very smart. Please give uh, Strager a follow. Thank you so much, everybody from the, Sh the Strager clan for coming through today. Um, yeah, we're about to we're about to check out though. Uh, sorry about that. I gotta, I, you know, I gotta get home and, you know, uh, the, well, the baby's probably asleep right now, but I gotta keep my, I can't stream for like three or four hours like I used to stream, unfortunately, even though it would be very, very fun to do so. Uh, but thank you so much for coming through. We're about to hit somebody else on a raid. So if you have any ideas on who you wanna raid, feel free to uh, to let me know um, who you wanna see or I'm about to go look right now. But again, if you're new to the channel, this is Mastermind Academy, where we're right now we're doing some boot camps. We're doing Camp Code, uh, which is every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, which is a software development, uh, software engineering uh, boot camp, 22 weeks, and it's we're using GoLang, and we're, we're we're focusing on programming fundamentals. Camp Cloud is on Tuesday, so this is cloud computing with AWS, and again, we're focusing on the core fundamentals there and AWS's core services, and we do a, a DevOps anthology on Thursdays, which is a bunch of smaller courses that make up a kind of a full DevOps pathway. So right now, we're doing Linux. If you don't know any Linux and you want to learn Linux, come on through. I Strager's audience, I'm pretty sure all y'all know Linux uh, for sure. Um, but if you want to come through, Linux is first, but we do a bunch of those, but that's every Thursday. Uh, and we'll do all the stuff, CI, CD, SysOp stuff, uh, you know, uh, all of the, all, you know, all the DevOpsy things, observability, all that stuff. And we will, uh, yeah, we'll do it. Oh, Leon's online? Oh, Leon's done? Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, we got to get to Leon before he, uh, before he gets off. Unless he's done, done. It, or is he at the same place that I am right now? Let's see. He's done, done? Ah, yeah, he's done, done. Okay. Well, cool. Oh, then let's, uh, oh no, Bash is playing. Bash is playing Apex. That would have been dope because I haven't been over there in a while. Hold on, let me get to the science and technology section. Software and game development. And let's see who's online. Do I know anyone? Midnight Simon doing leak code stuff. That's pretty dope. Let me see uh, someone. Wait, did he raid you? I don't think so. It didn't, it didn't say he did. Oh, that's annoying. I hear myself. Uh, let's, let's, let's see, let's go down lower. Let's go to somebody who doesn't have many viewers right now. That's always nice. That was always fun for me, uh, but kind of scary as well. Yeah, you get confused with emojis. That's, <laughs> I, I get it. What are people doing? Designing a new web framework, some blitz chess. <laughs> I, I would, I would. Simon, he's coding ASMR night. Uh, where's, where's Simon? What's, what's Simon's, what's Simon's name? Coding, is it just Simon? It makes you feel safe. I, I, I love it. That's my goal. I would love you to feel safe with my voice. Um. Oh, Midnight Simon. We just looked at it. Yeah. Let's do. Let's let's head over to Midnight Simon. Let's raid. And I mean, algorithms is great. So uh, this is a good thing. It, it, you know, it's, it, we're gonna get there. You'll be great at them when you're done here. But say hello to Midnight Simon. Thanks everybody for coming through. I'll see you tomorrow if you're interested in any cloud stuff and Wednesday or Thursday if you're interested in any DevOps stuff. Have a great evening. We're out of here in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Have a great night. See you later.